OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. Right, a very good morning to you. Welcome along. It is Tuesday morning. This is OTB AM. We're here with you all the way through until 10 o'clock this morning. If there's anything sports related or anything really that you want to get off your chest, 087 9180 is the WhatsApp number. You can leave a comment on our YouTube stream, youtube.com forward slash off the ball, or you can tweet us at off the ball AM. Shane, good morning to you. Good morning, how are things? Yeah, pretty good. It's um, Manchester City celebrations on the back pages. Mm-hmm. Uh, various players at the tops off at various stages, you know, as you would if you were. Um, I don't like that yet. Yeah, and it's. Uh, uh, day day two, day three. It's day three of the rollover. I want to say yeah. Saturday night, Sunday night, Monday night. Yeah, three nights. Some of them will have international football, but not many of them are going to have that many fixtures that matter. Because mm. like they're all going to be able to recover. Oh, Penny for Jack Grealish's thoughts right now. I mean, missing missing out on playing with Ireland and being in Greece. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I don't, I don't, I don't know if he'll have many thoughts right about now. Missing the war, World Cup, or the the warm weather training in Turkey. Yeah, of course. I'm sure he's gutted. Chance to slay Gus Poet. Yeah, yeah. Um, he saw him getting covered in champagne by Erling Haaland. He didn't look too pleased. Um, but yeah, he has leaned into the celebrations as only Jack Grealish would be expected to do. It's, you know, it's um, and why not? Is he is he the most popular English footballer of, of all time? Oh, I would say so. He's up there. Uh, certainly, this generation. Um, everyone kind of wants to see I, that was the kind of the general consensus <clears throat> a lot of United fans friends of mine and Liverpool fans as well who maybe didn't want to see Man City win at the weekend were all like happy for Grealish happy for Grealish and maybe only Grealish <laughs> and maybe Kevin De Bruyne as well um, Erling Haaland obviously deserves to be a Champions League winner so like there are nuggets of little modicums of positivity you can take you're delighted for, for Haaland are you? delighted for him yeah yeah, yeah. Delighted for such a talented footballer to win the, the pinnacle of European club Proud competition. Proud of his achievements. Yeah, of course. Uh, but no, I think that was the thing. A lot of uh, I was watching in a pub at home with uh, mainly United fans and a couple of Liverpool fans thrown in. And to be honest, when it was over, I was, it was just there was no feeling really. There was no. There wasn't even a sadness among rival fans that City had just won a treble or won the Champions League. It was like, all right, yeah, that's it done now. I think the point that Lipton made yesterday that they they won they won the treble when they beat Real and then yeah. they, they didn't just beat Real they smashed them and so because they smashed them everybody had to go okay well that's fair enough as in it's fair enough they're clearly the best team in Europe because we've been mm. calling them the best team in Europe for the last couple of years when they probably were the best team in Europe they just couldn't get over the line in this yeah. knockout competition yeah and, but, and I suppose the, the late chances for Inter kind of gave a little bit of hope to those watching and hoping for extra time penalties maybe an Inter win um, but yeah it was just a, a feeling of, of general emptiness and then even you, you, you watch the celebrations and it's like I mean they, they, they weren't exactly going mad on the pitch you're like you've just won the treble but then again I suppose I'm not going to judge I, them for, I, the, for I, the veracity I, I, of their celebrations can't be uh, um, the policing their celebrations are you? you no but normally, normally I'd be like Richard Keys here are you? but I'm not telling them to calm down I'm telling them to like Give them more. Oh yeah, okay. okay. Do you know, placing it the other way. I, I think they, they uh, and did they not prove you wrong with that bit? Well, certainly after after they left the stadium, they uh, they certainly made up for it. You can see by Jack Grealish's uh, probably smiley head on the, the back pages of most of the papers. So, so he's still going. He's he's been in Ibiza. Has he did he go to Ibiza and then back to uh, for the open top, or did he go after the open top to Ibiza? I I, I think they went to Ibiza first. So they they rented Ushuaia, uh, some one of the top clubs in Ibiza, a floor, entire floor, and partied, and then without sleep. I'm f- made it back, to made the, back to Manchester right so hadn't slept and flew from Ibiza and to how, Manchester. how do they keep going for so long uh, like you would wonder fair play to them I, I think excitement and happiness gets adrenaline energy you know they're, they're young Shane that's the other thing that you, you're, you're not uh, you're no longer as young as you used to true, be true true that's well, right, what so. age is Jack Grealish because uh, impressive it's about to hit him in a big way 27 he's 27 right well he's at the stage now where hangovers should be should be hitting him you see these lads don't drink too often Let's be honest. Do they not? Well, not oh, as, not oh, as much Walker as seems to have a good time. I mean, you know, yeah. he, he, he does be spotted out. He does, yeah. Um, I just think they can they can recover quicker. They're, they're going into, they're being forced to recover because they have to go in and get their medical treatment and get their get their massages. Must be easy to recover when you're living in a mansion. Do you know, is what I'm saying. But, um, it all helps. 
and then they're all in it together they're, they're waking up hungover in Ibiza to get in the plane and, and you're with people that makes hangovers easier I'm going to a festival this weekend Jer, So which one? Uh, Beyond the Pale in Glendalough so it's, it's that kind of thing you wake up in a group of your friends and you're like okay we're all in this together yeah 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 which makes it a bit easier so I, I, I'll probably be trying to I guess live through a bit of Jack Reelishisms this weekend that's my ultimate ambition yeah relying on your, your energy and your conditioning yeah exactly yeah yeah so well, fair play to you touch wood it's, it all goes to plan and uh, what is uh, uh, yeah, pardon my ignorance here but I thought that was like a hipster wellness festival but obviously there's some music there's some music thrown in but right. it's, it's definitely a hipster wellness festival there's a lot of, there's right. actually a bit of uh, sky watching in the woods oh some some shamanic renditioning yeah. of your aura breathing exercises meditation that sort of okay. thing so looking yeah. forward to all that as right, well right yeah Jojo's going as well reaching a higher yeah, consciousness yeah. so myself and Jojo this weekend will be sitting in a, in a forest in Whitlow somewhere together probably just breathing watching the stars and bit of microdosing yeah well yeah a oh. few, few cans you know mushrooms for breakfast yeah exactly I'm starting to sweat here okay well th- these are questions I brought it on myself I brought it on I wouldn't ask yeah. uh, well if anybody's any recommendations for uh, for Shane or can help him um, you know reach a higher plane of consciousness at any point then you know where to, to come for us yeah at off the ball AM on Twitter uh, there are actually loads of headlines we're going to get to I, I'll tell you what's coming up okay um, we're going to go to uh, Turkey to speak to John Fallon of the Irish Examiner ahead of Ireland's game against Greece on Friday uh, Queenie's going to join us at 8 o'clock we'll be talking about John Klein and the possibility that Johnny Sexton may be out for a long time before he comes back in advance of the World Cup Jason Byrne is going to talk to us about the Donegal report which we've seen now the um, the report seems to suggest that Donegal GA is in a bad way at the moment and needs a lot of help that was certainly the uh, benevolent reading of the report into the academy with maybe the exception of the planning around the academy which seems to have been very detailed and that was the one bit of the report that was detailed John Duggan's going to join us today 40 Conor Nolan's going to look back on Novak Djokovic becoming officially the greatest tennis player of all time Colm Nally the GA coach is going to talk to us about his new book GA football training tens and also just about the general state of the game at the moment which is actually uh, good timing because Davey Burke the Roscommon manager has spoken to the Independent this morning and he like us thinks the advance mark is a steaming pile of dog poo uh, attacking marks a joke says Burke um, he's making the point that Conor Callahan caught a ball six yards out and decided to take a point as opposed to you know doing what Conor Callahan would do if he was free to do or hadn't been conditioned to take the points. Uh, Cloud over Sexton World Cup warm-up. This is a story that's brewing about um, Sexton being reported for intimidating behaviour after the EPCR, sorry, after the uh, Champions Cup final by the uh, tournament organisers EPCR. And uh, so we'll see a potential 10 game, 10 week ban, which would put him out of the games in August. I'm not sure he was going to play too many minutes in the games in August, but you'd like the opportunity for him to play if, of course, he's going to be fit for the World Cup, which we still aren't entirely uh, sure of yet. Uh, interestingly, the Premier League clubs are, are looking to make more profits, which would involve a spending cap separate to financial fair play. Um, this is reported by the London Times. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see if they can actually manage to do this because um, everybody so far has been very reluctant to include a salary cap the players unions obviously don't want a salary cap because it's not good for um, for their players but also uh, the rich clubs uh, they're they're kind of ambivalent about this type of stuff mm. there's Pep smoking his cigar rain fails to dampen City Parade it was raining in Manchester who knew and then Carlo Ancelotti who left Everton to go and join Real Madrid is now suing them two years after leaving so it'll be very interesting to see this in the High Court if Everton uh, if, this, if the details of the um, case actually make it all the way if Everton are going to fight this and so then uh, if it does go to the High Court we'll get proper reporting on it but at the moment we don't really know why he's suing them specifically bad break up that one it seems to be he feels he's owed money by them obviously mm. even though he left he left them yeah. to go and join Real Madrid I mean, as you do. Yeah, he's had, he's had a good time since, you know. Yeah. Does, he, does he really need to be sticking it to Everton? It feels like Maybe a fever he does. Dream. That feels like a fever dream, doesn't it? The Ancelotti Everton period. It's like, was he really at Everton before Real Madrid? And then the Brendan Rodgers to Celtic story, which I, I thought was just a flyer. It was like, a, you know. But it, it isn't. It turns out that he's considering it. Why wouldn't he? He's loved. He's beloved. He's not. He was hated after he left. Well, after he, he left, but I mean, he's an absolute Judas. But I think people then uh, time passes and people move on and they go. Oh, you know what? It was actually a 
good period for Celtic. A lot of Celtic fans are going to be left with egg on their face. Oh, Brendan Rodgers, oh, screw you, we got Ange now, don't we? Gotta eat that like, humble oh, pie and move we, on. We don't have Ange. Oh no, he did the same to us. Brendan Rodgers did. Oh no. Yeah, he's come crawling back, Rodgers. It's not confirmed, of course, yet, but um, yeah, he was he was Bucky's favourite, wasn't he? From the, from the offset. Yeah. So I mean that hasn't changed. It's, if anything, he's got the, more of a narrow odds favourite. So it'll be interesting to see if that happens. Um, I think Celtic fans are just in mourning a little bit at the moment. And, and until this, the season starts, they will be in mourning because of their departure of their great Australian legend. Uh, come on, a few boys in green at the back page headline on the Sun. Uh, this is Nathan Collins um, saying that they've become acclimatised to the heat by being in Turkey for the last week. So, uh, you know, a lot, many international sides are just um, coming together now, obviously, in the aftermath of the Champions League final, because, you know, they might have had players who were involved. We obviously didn't. <laughs> and uh, so we've been able to um, have a training camp in warm weather in Turkey. It's been pretty warm here, so maybe they could have taken the risk in retrospect to have it in Ireland, but uh, better safe than sorry. I'm delighted to say John Fallon of the Irish Examiner is with us from uh, Sweaty Turkey, from Sweaty Dublin. Hello, John. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, Jared. Good morning to you. What is the... Because at one point, at one point it looked like the weather wasn't going to be that hot, but I think it, things have got um, spicier as the time has gone on. Yeah, it's uh, it's now just 9.30 local time and we're just creeping up towards 30 degrees. So if the purpose of this was to acclimatise, it's certainly working. So um, they're finishing up here tomorrow. And then flying over the AGNC to Athens to get ready uh, for Friday. So, yeah, it's been a real warm weather camp. It's hard to overstate how important this game is. It kind of feels like it's all boiling down to the games against Greece are basically going to decide how well or otherwise we feel this uh, qualifying campaign has gone. Yeah, well, just <clears throat> the, the pure maths of it is we're third seed, they're fourth seed. So, with two teams going through, I think you have to beat the teams beneath you to have any chance because you have to presume that the two above you will 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 get six or potentially four. So you certainly can't afford to slip up to this early stage. So um, when we looked at the schedule, you know, last October, this was a game you looked at and said, yeah, it's um, it's tough, um, but maybe the heat has been overstated a bit because it is it is quite uh, I think it's quarter to nine local time. Uh, it's kicking off at so it shouldn't be too much of a factor especially what they've gone through here in the nine days to prepare for it and really not made the same mistake as last year when we wilted in Yerevan uh, I was there myself and while well, we did okay in the first half I think once they scored we didn't really have a response it was only bringing Chain Duffy up at the end um, and he's not around obviously anymore so um, we need to be ready we need to be conditioned for whatever unfolds on Friday in terms of who's available, um, so uh, how strong a squad is it at the moment? Who isn't uh, available for the games this week? Yeah, there's two mainly. It's it's Seamus Coleman and Chidozi Ogbené, uh, who both would have started against France. So those two aren't here due to injury. Uh, this morning's training session uh, of the 26 players, only Mark Travers set it out. Just He was under the weather, we were told. So... Everyone else is here and, and, and is not injured, let's say, whatever about their match fitness level. So um, if you take out those two players, you know, you've probably got good replacements there. Like we always probably did have an abundance of centre backs and right wing backs. So um, Alan Brown will be a contender there to think to come in the way Stephen Kenny's been talking in the last few weeks. Uh, on that side and then you know Benny's place you've, you, you probably the two main ones are are the two Michaels which is Obafemi and Mikey Johnson um, who you know provide their threats in their own individual way different types of players um, but, they're, but, but they're good options um, and of course then we have the man at the moment Evan Ferguson so uh, he's looks like he's just watching him there this morning he's looks fairly uh, in good tip top condition so in a tight game like this, I think it might come, might boil down to that. It could be just one chance uh, that will settle this game. It, 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 there's been some reports that they've been playing first versus seconds. It, it, can you tell us anything about that? Is that is that true? In terms of the team, yeah, uh, training games, yeah. Uh, 
just just gone there now you mean well in terms I, of the, I, I saw some photographs from um uh, during the week and it looked like they had played a 70 minutes uh, oh excuse me excuse me oh yeah that was on saturday evening yeah they played they played the uh, 11 v 11 70 minute match um yeah that's that's true i think he's a fair idea of his team at this stage um, uh, and they're working on that so I don't expect many surprises I think we'd probably if we all had a go with the team we'd probably get 10 of them right maybe just one or two positions um, that have to be decided and obviously the goalkeeper is one as well but I still think he'll he'll stick with Bizzuno, um despite the fact that he, he was dropped for the last eight games I think it was with Southampton so um, yeah so there's sort of the critical calls but but it's it, 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 there, there won't be anything contentious I don't foresee that uh, John James McLean is, is only a couple of caps off the, the 100 club I'm, I'm fairly sure so he'll be keen to, to get on the pitch surely in both of these matches um, would you expect he could start in Greece or is it Callum O'Dowda that, that's favoured I think it's a, I think it's O'Dowda because he was lined up to play against France after doing very well um, and scoring against Lafayette but he got injured so I would expect O'Dowda to start Um doesn't mean that McLean won't come on because he's versatile um, and I think we'll definitely see him uh, on Monday against Gibraltar um, it's just the nature of these games you know you've seen them the, the, the double headers he generally does change a couple of players and McLean has sort of played in one of those if you look over the history of it so yeah he could get the 100 caps so I would expect on Friday if he's to be involved it'll be off the bench and probably starting on Monday so yeah he'll join the 100 club over the next week which, which is which is a great achievement and he doesn't look like he's slowing down out there. He's a, he's in his fitness wise. He's he's still on still on top, Nick, and uh, <clears throat> just got a new contract, of course, at, at Wigan. So he's starting, he's uh, still in demand. Do we know where the uh, the Greek threats lie? Because well, it's it's far from a Greek team of two thousand and four, but but they still possess certain dangers that we'll have to cope with. Yeah, it's just just looking. I think it's twenty years next year, next year when they. Um, uh, they won the Euros. Um, so then, the, the, like looking at the team, it's 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 more of a team that's built on the on sort of defensive solidity. Like the goalkeeper is very good from Benfica. You know, so you got Baldock uh, from Sheffield United. You got the Liverpool player on the other side, and like they beat Gibraltar three 0 in March, um, which you know you expect them to win, but it's still it's still a fairly emphatic result. Um, but I suppose the the, uh, the the consolation from Marseille is that they went out against Lithuania a few days later and, and couldn't score so they oh the line to Turkey's just dropped there we'll try and get John back in one second what's the Wi-Fi like in Turkey um, really good yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> better, better than the uh, the system of getting to a stadium it turns out yeah uh, well um, different part of Turkey obviously of course Antalya yeah yeah yeah, yeah. How far is Antalya from Istanbul? That's a good question. It's probably, uh, it's, it's probably... Good lawyers never ask questions they don't already know the answer to, yeah, but... Um, I'll tell you now. Um, it's a, a, a flight, anyway. Sorry, the heat. I can feel the heat through the uh, the, the camera there talking to John. It's like you can you can sense, you know, when the, the screen gets a little bit fuzzy. So maybe the heat is the, is the thing. Oh, but so it's a, it's a nine-hour drive. 695 kilometres. Um, pretty pretty far. We were doing Anthony Nash recently. He was uh, out playing golf and I was doing the piece in the car and the line dropped and he said the iPhone overheated. So um, I would be terribly surprised if something relatively similar was happening. Um, They're literally at opposite ends of the country. So Istanbul, North North Turkey, and Italian in the south. Um, but yeah, those, decision, those decisions that he has to make, like the Bazunu Kelleher doesn't feel like a decision. Um, you know, I, I know Kelleher played the last game in the Premier League season, but... Keller playing the Latvia friendly and Bazunu playing the French game. I don't think anything has changed in Stephen Kenny's mind since that. Um, the Mikey Johnston Obafemi one is is an interesting one for me. Like, I think the stadium lit up when when Mikey Johnston played against. Was it Latvia came on against in that friendly game? Uh, had a chance to score straight away. So uh, I'd love to see Mikey Johnston get an opportunity in a game like this in a bit of heat as well. I think he's played abroad, so he, he probably is used to it. So um, that'll be the interesting one. Um, yeah. But Ferguson, Ferguson looking good, he said. Well, no. I just, just like just to get the hype train going a little bit more. Evan Ferguson, that tip top shape. That's what we need to hear. Well, uh, these games, you, you can't overstate the importance of this game. Everything is going to come down to our performance against the the Greeks. If we play really well against the Greeks in the two games and get a point, scramble to get a point from mm. any of the uh, remaining games against the top two, uh, then you know we could qualify as one of the. 
I can't even remember the myriad uh, ways that you, you a strong finish in the group and then he'll have the opportunity I think to start the next campaign mm. but if this goes badly then the noise around the Kenny era resumes and uh, we face into the existential crisis of Irish football is the acceptance that we need six points in these games like no I don't three points away from home against a Greek side who won their division I don't think I think anybody expects you to take problem. the draw away from home Beat, beat the Gibraltar son. Yeah, I have to. Well, obviously, yeah. And with a good quality performance against Gibraltar, where it's controlled and we create chances and we score those chances. But then, when you're so when you when you perform like that against France, and albeit at home, you keep Mbappe as quiet as you do. You keep Griezmann as quiet as as you do. All of a sudden, you're looking at a game against Greece, even though it's, it is away from home, and you're thinking, well, why can't we go and win this game? Um, that might sound like remarkable optimism given where Irish football has been at um, but I think just based on the French game there's no reason why we can't go and, and, and win this this, this match um, I'm fascinated to hear Nathan Collins' comments in the papers this morning talking about the the Kevin Moran documentary and, and taking things from that I always find it fascinating when what was he saying? He, well, he, well he was saying he just took took a lot of things from it he, he saw it for a start but it's funny when you hear professional footballers you know you're like oh, these lads don't have time then you then you forget they have all the time in the world yeah. to watch things like this uh, and play pool and do all the rest um, but just it's interesting to hear Nathan Collins saying all the right things um, and, and I'm, he's kind of Kevin Moran esque in his physicality, I would say. Excuse me. Um, but yeah, no, I watched that Kevin Moran documentary, and you'd, you'd certainly watch it and have to take something from it. It was inspiring, like um, just the madness of the whole situation. He was like he was on the drink, he was on the the drinking team with Whiteside and all these lads. Yeah. But completely got away from all the the negative publicity that the rest of them got. McGrath and all these fellas. He used to sneak out like maybe ten minutes before shit really hit the fan. Some like an Irish goodbye. Basically, Kevin Moran was very smart, so he ultimately has been lumped in the the same breaths as uh, as McGrath and Whiteside, possibly. We're just trying to reconnect with John Fallon from the Irish Examiner, talking about the Ireland Greece game. If anybody has any uh, thoughts on this and and what we need to to see happen um, in Athens on Friday evening, uh, we'll obviously be live on Off the Ball, bringing you comment- uh, uh, coverage of the game um, uh, between seven and ten on Friday evening. But uh, yeah, look, Nathan Collins out in front of the press yesterday. Mm. It, it was a really unfortunate end to the season when Lopetegui came in. There hasn't been any confirmation yet about Lopetegui staying. I presume if he was going, we would have heard this by now, right? Unless yeah. I missed it, did I? No, I, I don't think there's been any word of that. Uh, and Wolves' season kind of petered out. They weren't in, in line for anything. I was at Old Trafford for their the Wolves' second last game of the season and, and the performance uh, from both teams. Like United were poor, but Wolves uh, and Collins didn't really feature that day. But... Wolves kind of just petered out to the season Lopetegui had nothing to play for they weren't going for Europe they weren't trying to stay up um, so Collins is one of those players that maybe has been lacking a little bit of sharpness a little bit of game time like Abafemi has started um, just once since um, for Burnley yeah like which which is not great and that's probably why Mikey Johnston's name is being thrown in all of a sudden um, now you saw a year ago against Scotland the type of finishing that Obafemi is capable of on the international scene and very often you have players who come in we know that from an Irish perspective you mightn't be playing at club level but all of a sudden they can come into an international window their, their attitude changes their mood changes and they, they end up scoring a goal or two or, or having a man of the match performance so I'm not really concerned by Obafemi not playing I wasn't concerned by Nathan Collins not getting much game time towards the tail end of the season it doesn't really matter even Cuevin Kelleher like if he was thrown in ahead of Gavin Mizunu having just played the last game of the season um, for Liverpool I still wouldn't be concerned um, especially from a goalkeeping perspective I guess it's not as important but yeah I think the lack of game time doesn't really matter and I was glad to see them go into Antalya like you saw some of the images of that of those training sessions during the week Evan Ferguson up against Jeff Hendrick I think is in the back of some of the papers um, and just the sweaty like it just looks like complete dead heat complete sweat and um, the best possible preparation for a game in Greece so hopefully it's not too much for them at this stage of the season as well they'll, they'll be tired legs yeah I mean I, you do feel as well like there's an opportunity for Collins to get back in with a full off season to hopefully impress Lopetegui it, you know in, in that context these games are kind of big for him to take his two weeks off go back early be on time show up for everything win a place back and Lopetegui is clearly a really class manager so you'd be hopeful that he came in steadied the ship 
avoid relegation and next season he'll look to impro- improve and incorporate a talent like Collins in the team otherwise if that's not going to be the case and Collins needs to move on um, so uh, who who's coming in for Coleman what's the what's the way the team lines up is it yeah I don't know what I don't know what Kenny would opt for like because that's that's probably one that um he, he wasn't expecting when you look at the French French performance Coleman was a was a key cog um like who do you put you see the, how you play in the heat as well is another one but then that's probably why the the uh, McLean and um Callum O'Dowda alter alterations have to happen both are fit both are pacey you probably have to change them around over the course of the 90 minutes given the heat probably the same on the right hand side as well well you can make your five subs you know yeah like there's, there's definitely a case for uh, for the five subs being made and you replace your full backs and you replace yeah we've got, we've got John Fallon back on the phone John we were just talking about the um, the, the actual decisions to be made um, so what's what's the starting back three uh, I, I would think um, the back three will probably be um, what started against France, which was Darrow O'Shea, John Egan, and Nathan Collins. I think that's fairly much locked in. I know Darrow has only come back from injury, um, so there might be a slight concern over him, but Stephen certainly will be a big fan of his, so I don't see him um, being displaced looking at the options, the alternatives that are there, so uh, I think that gives us a good core to work off. So Doherty comes in at right back. And uh, no, I think Doherty will stay left back. Okay. The way he is, and then right back will probably probably be Alan Brown. Um, uh, Doherty did quite well against uh, France on the left side, and now he's played him there for for big games. So I just think with the options, as we said, with Coleman out, um, uh, that, that 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 Brown could be the winner. Um, again, like like O'Shea, he he didn't play a lot in April and May uh, towards the end of the championship, but um, he's he's, a, he's an all reliable um, as Alan Brown. So I think he could get the nod. Okay, and uh, from that point forward, then the only other decision to be made is going to be whether or not it's Mikey Johnson or, or Obafemi who comes in for Chidoz Egbeni. Is that is that your instinct that everything else is kind yeah, of nailed on? Yeah, yeah, I would think so. I think Jason Nice is probably is probably a shoe in uh, on the other side. You know, if he's playing with two tens, um, now he could, he could, he, you know, he could be flexible in the formation. He did say that that Ogbeni gives him a certain. Uh, threat that he can't, he doesn't really have a like for like replacement. So you know, Johnson, if he was played, he, he could go for it or wide rather than narrow in the ten. Um, but I would think that's probably the main dilemma he has is between those two. So again, a bit, a bit like the um, <laughs> um, what we were talking about earlier. You, you may you may see both players, but um, yeah. So that's that's really what, you, what you're looking at you know, in terms of decision making. One of the things we were talking about was. Um, the, the line was down there was Nathan Collins is on the back of all the papers today and, and whether or not he feels he's going to get back in under Lopetegui whether or not Lopetegui stays it, this is a, it's kind of like a, a little oasis of calm for many of the Ireland players even though the, the stakes are very high in the Greece game compared to the situation that many of them find themselves in at club level is your sense that there will be significant change for many of the Irish players in this squad when it comes to where they're playing their football come September? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, now I don't think Collins comes into that category, but certainly others. Um, you know, you start, you start in goal, and Cleveland Callagher is, is is probably the big one. Like, I definitely expect him to move on because if he's got any chance of challenging Bazunu, he's got to be playing. And I think the development there with um, with the Brentford goalkeeper Raya, I think that could certainly open up a place uh, for him to go in there. It's, it's probably an ideal club for him to go in so you know now he, like he, he's just one um, that you know his club future is, is going to be resolved this, this summer you know Chidozzi Ben is not here but he's probably going to move on from other I know he's a few offers as well so yeah there's quite a lot of them that are in that, that, are in that position whereby they you know they'll, they'll be they'll be looking at, at different different options in the summer you know uh, the other one that springs to mind is Tro- Troy Paris um, you know, change the manager at Tottenham. Um, does he see he's any chance of getting in there? Probably unlikely. Um, so he has a decision to make. I think um, in terms of a permanent move. Um, so yeah, there's quite a lot of them. You know, when you look when you look through the, the squad, there's, 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 there's at least probably half a dozen of them. I think will be will be moving. 
do we over think, the next uh, couple of months do we think Obafemi ends up at Burnley permanently or like is that one still up in the air as well yeah no I, th- I think he is I think he, I think Vincent Company signed them with the Premier League in mind I think they were they were, they were almost halfway there starting when in January when he bought them and I know he used them sparingly but I think uh, he, he will he will be part of their bid to, you know to consolidate in the first year Um because he has that light and pace that is so crucial, and um, yeah, I, 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 that would I don't I don't see any movement. I, I still still think that he'll be he'll be a brand new player for for the season, or certainly up up to January. John, what's the what's the situation with Tom Cannon? Um, uh, it appears to be, of course, he met, missed one of the last international camps with, with uh, reported tonsillitis. Um, does he seem to be heading towards England as opposed to to Ireland now at this stage? Never looks good, does it? Um, when you when, when you hear these uh, these stalling situations, um, I don't know whether he'll end up because there's a few variables there. Like like England's twenty ones have been on to him, but they have their own Euros next month. So I wouldn't. I'd say they're thinking of him more for the you know the next campaign. Um, but yeah, like it's you know you've seen the stuff about him deleting pictures and things, which is which is which is which is a concern. So. Um, yeah, from what I believe, that you know England are quite keen on him, and uh, you know because if you look at if you look at sort of the future of England strikers, there's not an abundance of them there, and he still has plenty to prove. But he did get eight goals um, in that loan spell. You know, Troy Parry only got three, so um, you know he probably had claims to get into the senior squad. But the fact that he had tonsillitis meant that he couldn't go on sort of the you know the, the post club season program, um, and then you know the dreaded phone call came from his agent, so. Um, yeah, is it you know is is it, has the damage been done? You know, already the fact that he's that he's hesitating. You know, we 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 all know some hardcore sort of you know Irish players are English born who would who, who wouldn't wait around for him now. But um, I don't expect that to be resolved anytime quickly. You know, as I said, just just the way things are panning out. Um, but yeah, you'd have to be you'd have to be worried about uh, his future with Ireland. All right, John Fallon of the Irish Examiner, we let you go. You're great with your time. Thanks a million. Cheers. Thanks, bye-bye. It's uh, John Fallon with the Irish Press Corps who are on their way to Athens uh, with the team. And that game is Friday evening. And uh, as I said, hard to oversay just how important a fixture that one is. It's a minute past eight. Time for the cash machine. Off the balls. Summer cash machine. Yeah, so the Summer Cash Machine is here. We're in the midst of another hot winning streak. We've now had five winners in a row. Caroline Murphy became the latest winner on Monday when we called and she had the number written down. Taking part is easy. Every day we give you an amount, you take note of it, enter, and if it's you that we call, you tell us the amount and you win the cash. The Summer Cash Machine has been reloaded. It's €20,582.31. To enter, text OTB, in just those letters, OTB, to 57557. If we call you back after 3 o'clock on Tuesday, June 13th, answer your phone within five rings and tell us the price amount you win the money to enter text OTB to 57557 cost is 250 plus your standard message rate to play you've got to be over 18 you're playing across the go loud network of stations and full terms and conditions are on our website at offtheball.com the cash machine will randomly pick one winner at uh, so long as you've entered by 3 o'clock on Tuesday June 13th and it could be you were calling answer within 5 rings tell us the prize amount and the cash is yours the number again 20,582 euro and 31 cents text OTB to 57557 we're back after these with Alan Quinlan the balls summer cash machine top pocket goal ahead of this summer's football in Australia we we're going to Australia it's what dreams are made of we'll be hosting a night of celebration for the Republic of Ireland women's national team in partnership with Sky and it's coming your way on June 28th in the Mansion House in Dublin what a moment for the Republic of Ireland we'll be joined by the full squad I don't know what we've just done you know I did believe we could do it as well as some other great guests as we give the team a night to remember Emma Bird is in tears <laughs> I can't believe it we finally done it tune in to all of Off The Ball's channels for a chance to win tickets to this exclusive event Sky proud primary partners of the Republic of Ireland women's national team Out believe together and we can go anywhere they are going to the World Cup finals 
OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. It's four minutes past eight. A reminder that you can get all the action in Rugby Daily in your OTB podcast network feeds. Just uh, search OTB Rugby and you can uh, subscribe to Rugby Daily. It brings you everything you need to know about rugby every day. It's all in partnership with Deliveroo. Deliveroo has some great bundles and deals. Open the app, make your choice and watch your rider come to you. Deliveroo, food, we get it. Alan Quillen, good morning to you. How are you? Very good, Jared, knowing yourself. Yeah, pretty good. Um, you've been uh, on the John Klein hype train for the last six months, it's fair to say. Uh, his, his booster in chief. Uh, the Ireland selectors weren't listening, but um, Razzy Rasmus obviously was. And uh, lo and behold, he's part of South Africa's plans for the World Cup as it stands. Yeah, I was. Uh, I could probably caught everybody surprise, by surprise, I suppose, when um, he was announced as the 41st player in. in in the South African squad, um, Jack Nienenbar, obviously, and Rassi Erasmus um, see uh, an option of bringing him into the squad. I, I think Eben Etzebet is is still out injured, um, and probably if you look at the the makeup of the South African second rows, it's hard to see John John, John Klein uh, being picked in the World Cup squad. But if you look at the Rugby Championship, they play. Australia at home, New Zealand away, and and then they're home to Argentina. It's a shortened rugby championship this year, obviously because of the World Cup um, in September. Um, they they see him as an option, maybe, and they can add some value into 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 the South African squad. So it's it's a strange one. I, you know, I suppose it's he has played very very well. Um, I think he's still a bit tarnished. A little bit of it is unfair from from what happened in, in 2019. Um, I think he's a better player now. He's probably improved under the monster coaching team this year and been unbelievably consistent in his performances. He, he's viewed differently, obviously, from from the the Irish second rows. And I'm not saying that's wrong. I think to criticise Andy Farrell or Paul O'Connell, you know, as the forwards coach, and say they they've they've missed a beat here. Um, is wrong because you know they've proven the last number of years that they've they've done remarkably well with this Irish team. But um, he brings obviously something different, and um, yeah, it's a, it's a talking point, isn't it? And uh, I'm pleased for John Klein. Obviously, um, the three year period um, and and the application for him has gone into World Rugby, um, and we're not sure yet. Um, what their answer will be but I presume it will be that he's eligible to play for South Africa again Tough to blame John Klein himself as well Quinny, when you consider the last cap came in the in the World Cup in 2019 so he's been he's been sitting around waiting as well Yeah and that game was against him all at the World Cup and um, you know I, I think I saw some quotes this week about um, probably the criticism and the furore over him being selected ahead of Devon Toner and look at the time it was a big talking point Joe Schmidt, obviously, Simon Easterby at the time, they saw something different in, in John Klein that he could add value to the Irish squad. And um, look, obviously, Shane, his biggest strength is, is very obvious. He's a very, very physical player. Um, he's six foot eight, 121 or two kilos, um, offers huge strength and power. But probably the way Ireland play, um, and, and the short space of time maybe that he would have had now if he was brought into the Irish squad to adapt to that attacking style and that pace and tempo that the Irish team play with, it's probably too short a period of time. Um, if he had been in and out of Irish squads, even if he wasn't playing in the last couple of seasons, I think it would have um, benefited him and he, he would probably be in there. Um, but it's, 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 you know, I go back to what I said Um it's hard to be critical of them, but for me personally, I would certainly be be very interested to have him in around the Irish squad because he obviously brings something different. And you've probably said this many times, Ger. Lots of people have had it, said it. Um, the physicality is the probably one concern and one thing that we've probably spoken about in the last couple of years. It, 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 John Klein isn't the the answer to all of that, but I just think he brings something a little bit different. But Going back to what I said about Andy Farrell, Paul O'Connell, what they've done with this Irish team has been superb. Um, so it's hard to be critical and say this is a shocking decision or anything like that. It's not. Um, but it's a great opportunity for John Klein. You said that, Shane, and uh, it's a chance for him to 
to experience training with international players again and um, yeah it's uh, hopefully he doesn't come back to bite us and he doesn't end up playing against us in Paris uh, so his his Munster confirmed in 2022 that he'd signed a two-year extension and would be with the province until at least June 2024. But that's probably going to be the end of that then because he'll now be re-registered as a non-Irish player. And so that limits the number of players you can have in your squad who are non-Irish qualified. And it might tie up their hands a little bit when it comes to summer recruitment. If, if they go and, and sign non-Irish qualified players um, for Munster, yes, it might. I think this this one may be viewed a little bit differently. It depends. It's it's down to the RFU, really, isn't it? Because it's it's not a, a world rugby law that you can only have three non-Irish qualified players with the Irish provinces and Irish. It's an Irish RFU uh, directive, and they're kind of stuck to their guns. It used before, um, and and one development player. So it's been reduced a little bit. Um, and it's been beneficial for Ireland. I think there's been a lot of criticism, I think, um, uh, by some of the provinces, particularly Ulster, when they had um, the scrum half, his name, the South African scrum half a number of years ago, um, and John Cooney signed for Ulster. And then he's he benefited really and got into the Irish squad. Um, but look, Ruben Pinar. Ru- Ruin Pienaar, sorry, yeah. when Ruin Pienaar left and that his his contract was blocked, um, there's been one or two kind of high profile ones. But if you from Munster next year, they've 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 Alex Alex Nankivell is coming in um, in the centre, um, and they've got our RG name and obviously, um, so you know their their quota is not full, but their squad is done for next year anyway. Um, so it, it does depend, obviously, if they go. Um, the following season, trying to recruit non-Irish qualified players, um, it may it may impact them. But again, we don't know. But maybe it'll be viewed differently um, if they do go looking for a number of players um, in in that regard. But look, it's it's um, there's been a fair bit of stuff online. I've been reading it. Some people are kind of trumpeting that you know John Klein should be in the Irish squad. Um, I don't think he's going to be in the World Cup squad either for South Africa. But what, but I do think may happen here is he may play one or two tests in the Rugby Championship for 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 South Africa. Maybe involved. Um, you know, if you look at the second rows they have, they've they've obviously got plenty of options. They're familiar players: Lou Dieger, Etzebet, Marvin Ori's in there. Snaman is back in. Peter Steff de Toy, who's obviously been playing in the back row for the last couple of years, and Franco Mostart. So they have a they have a lot of quality there. There's six guys there who can play in the second row. And as I said, Etzebet is is still out injured. I'm not sure when he's due back. Um, so you know whether John Klein gets capped here again by South Africa or plays, we're, we're not really sure. But you know, you said at the start, I've been I've been trumpeting. Jean Klein uh, Ger- and rightly so I think because I think if you look at the the way he's improved his game um, and I think probably where the other Irish second rows are more advanced with him if we want to know what, why I think the reason is the short period of time that he would have to get up to speed with the way Ireland play but also it's the skill set probably that the other players possess um, Kieran Treadwell hasn't always been a starter for Ulster this year he's in the squad ahead of him um, Joe McCarthy is a very young player and maybe fits that type of profile of power and physicality that, that um, Andy Farrell has at his disposal and he is a very very good player Joe McCarthy so Ian Henderson is back uh, in the squad as well um, Ty Bourne and James Ryan are the other second row so it's not an area that we're blessed with huge depth uh, but you can't have it both ways you can't have this guy sitting in the background and if somebody gets injured he then gets called up and and you know you can't blame him for for taking this opportunity if, um, if South Africa give it to him and I saw training pictures last night of him he tra- he's training with the squad he's there with them at the moment with the South Africans and it'll be interesting to see how it plays out Ryan Baird another of those options as well like it's it's one of those positions that's just uh, blessed with talent Quinny like uh, John Klein would add a lot to those talents but as you say probably getting up to speed with the with the, with the way they play is, is one of the most important things yeah and, and obviously Ryan Baird yes but he's he's in as a back or kind of utility player yeah. and, and that's similar to the Peter Steff the toy role for South Africa 
Um, and I wonder, is there a little bit of uh, mind games here and a little bit of an unsettling scenario from from, uh, from Jack Dean and Baron Rassi? Because, you know, that's, that game in Paris in September is going to be um, a humdinger, really. Um, but yeah, all the the profile and the type of players that Ireland have are, are a little bit different. Is that and you mean? Viewed a, you mean give us the calls? Is that what it is? Here, come on in, tell us all the calls, tell us exactly what they're doing. You show us what the what the lineup moves are. What are the tells that you know about the uh, Leinster and Ulster hookers who are in the squad? But possibly, um, I don't know if John Sean Klein will know the the ex- exact li- Irish lineout calls. Um, and listen, I'm sure most teams they change them pretty often anyway. And I'm sure that for this block of of um, of, of of matches and build up to the World Cup, uh, knowing Paul like I do, um, and and his kind of attention to detail, he probably will change up the lineup calls a little bit. But yeah, it, it may be beneficial. Uh, but of course, RG Snyman is there as well, isn't he? Um, Jason Jenkins was in with the South Africans in November. Um, and he that's a, probably a bit of an eye opener he hasn't played that well um, he, I know he had an injury at the tail end of the season but probably didn't do what Leo Cullen wanted him to do particularly in that final um, and he's not brought into the South African squad but based on what we've seen and the consistency of Klein over the year he's played 24 games this year started all 24 games um, 16 in the, in the league itself he missed rounds 3 and 7 and then five in the Champions Cup, and obviously three in the quarterfinal, semi-final, final for you know the URC knockouts. And um, he's he's pretty tenacious and doesn't get injured a lot. I know he probably plays 60, 65 minutes for Munster a lot, but um, he's been brilliant. And look, it's good for the individual himself. It will certainly give him a little bit of a lift and a spring in his step um, he's had a good few years there trudging with Munster and had a lot of disappointments so I'm really pleased for him and um, where it ends up and what happens who knows but he could very easily get capped here you, you said it Jared the one worry if this would come back if Munster were to go and try and get a couple of non-Irish qualified players maybe for the 24-25 season onwards um, because they're, they're saying their quota is full for next year there's still a little bit of talk about and whispers about maybe a front row addition who knows um, but um, that's the one area and situation that might might affect that and obviously if he plays for Springboks will they try and get him back to one of the um, their teams in South Africa after you know the 20 after this season he's one more year contracted for Munster uh, and yeah, and like that'd be totally fair from their perspective as well. Just in terms of the the whispers around somebody coming in to the front row, like that's generally the area that people would have pointed to that is preventing them from being contenders to win the European Cup, right? That would have been one of the, the main areas that people talked about. Do they have a stronger case with the IRFU now having won the league, saying, "Well, look what we're doing already. We're we're very close to being proper contenders for a European Cup." Um, yeah, if they, look, in, in very simple terms here, if you pushed a boat here and you got a kind of an open checkbook and you said, right, take this monster squad and you can add two or three players to it, um, that is probably the one area that you would look at. It seems quite disrespectful to the to, to the players that are there. And, you, you know, you don't want to go down that road of of questioning people and saying they're not good enough. I think what you want, to, uh, what Munster want to try and get to, is to try and have their players on the Irish team. When you have the likes of Porter and Furlong, Sheehan, Kelleher, um, Keane Healy, you know you have five or six guys there who are are regulars um, with the national squad. Michael Alalato is obviously an international as well. So you probably have six, seven guys who are internationals. And that probably does make a difference, and it's no probably it makes a difference in Europe. Um, even look what Rog has with La Rochelle, the depth he has there around that area. Um, most of the front rows nowadays are you know going 50, 60 minutes because it's it's the tempo and the pace of the game has increased. We've seen um, a lot of the evidence in in a lot of the competitions towards the end of the season that the ball and play time is a lot higher nowadays in the modern game which is great for the game because we had a period there probably two or three years ago 
where there was a lot of stop start stuff there was a trend of a lot of kicking it's still an important part of the game but there's so much movement in the game now um, and for Munster yeah you, you would think that um, if you had that open checkbook that it's not necessarily <clears throat> I think the two positions would be hooker and tight head if you had a choice of one player to bring in a top class world class player there who not necessarily would you know stunt the development and the growth of of the likes of Dermot Barron or or stop Niall Scannell played who's played over 20 times for Ireland and it's been brilliant this year Dermot Barron um, has really improved his game as well you you have the tight hit situation of Roman Salanoa Keenan Knox we haven't seen much of him and you have to admit and say that you know what Stephen Archer has done in the latter tail end of the season has, has, has really been remarkable you know it's just been he's been an unsung hero for Munster but it's cropped up a couple of times this season where they've struggled probably in that area and the one that jumps out the most is the Sharks game in the, in the Champions Cup so um, it's probably something that you know if you want to get to that next level you, you want your players and, and I always said this and it was probably one of our mottos when I played in my time that the more players you get on the Irish team, the better you will be when you head into Europe. So obviously, current regular internationals. Um, and Munster will have a few more, you would think now. And I think there's some good young players coming through. But Le- Leinster are still the envy of everyone, you know, 12, 13 guys in the Irish team. And, and that's where that's kind of the standard where you want to get to. But John Ryan is coming back next year. He's done really well with with the Chiefs and Super Rugby, so they, you know they'll have a spring in their step. But you know, ultimately, Toulouse is another team. You know, you've six international props there, and you've just taken three the three of the front rows off, and yeah. three internationals are coming on. So it, it, we, we, we'll see. But I think that's probably the to get to that next level in Europe you need that kind of sort of depth Okay I do want to ask you about um, the story that's been reported widely at this stage that uh, Johnny Sexton faces a ban um, the letter that was served by the EPCR to Leinster and Sexton uh, I think in, in, in kids are phrase I might get this wrong but it's uh, about intimidatory language in the direction of the, the referee so um this you know, obviously there was a lot made in the aftermath of the game of the refereeing decision and the fact that uh, words words were exchanged. A potential for a ten week ban in the build up to the World Cup. Does this matter? Like, would it matter if he wasn't available for games, given it's been going to be months and months and months since he played? Um, look, it's it's it does matter. Of course, it matters. Um, it would matter more if he was going to miss crucial games in the World Cup. Um, obviously nowadays aside from all the cameras that were at the pitch you know people with camera phones all that kind of stuff um, you've got to be careful and you know, we know Johnny is pretty passionate and and um, I think he was I'm not sure even looking back at the game how he would um, be kind of I was trying to think of what incidents in the game that he would have been so frustrated with with with, with um, Yako Piper with the referee Yako Piper that day um, obviously in, I think the week before maybe in the Munster Leinster game there was probably one or two decisions that people questioned um, I'm not saying it's 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 right or wrong to have a go at a referee but look when you're not in the 23 it probably um, looks a little bit different it doesn't look right and you know people could clearly see Johnny going out onto the field and exchanging some sort of pleasantries with the, the, the coach the, the referee and officials and, and his assistant referees so um, look it's not ideal and I think if you I don't think Johnny's spoken on this yet but I think if you do if you did speak to him he'd probably say he regrets it and that's it was the heat of the moment stuff so Look, I hope they, they, they Leinster and, and Johnny Sexton have got to respond to the EPCR. Um, I'm sure he will get some sort of a rap on the knuckles for it because it's something that you know we 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 don't see in rugby. We don't want want to see either. Um, I've probably been in, involved in a few exchanges myself, but when the gear is on, you're seen in a little bit more of a sympathetic situation that you're kind of that adrenaline and all that stuff is is up and you've played the match um, so we, we don't know we'll have to hear from Johnny Sexton himself 
um, when he when he speaks about it, I'm sure you know in the build up to the World Cup and those warm up games he'll be asked a lot about it. Um, but look, it's it's uh, it's not ideal, and um, I hope that obviously from an Irish point of view that he doesn't. Um, they don't come down too hard on him. They do got to. They have to address it in some way. But again, we don't know what's said. Um, the, the the wording, as you said, was from the referees. Um, the referee was that his vocabulary was intimidating, and I'm sure he regret he regrets that and probably um, needs to be a bit more careful. The hope is that they're not trying to make a point here. The EPCR, you know, because they could they could apply tournament specific match bans that that would not necessarily impact the warm-up games which would be a worst case scenario doomsday scenario but hopefully they're not trying to make a point here with this uh, well, well look I think making a point then is that they'll, if they f- f- find that the, the vocabulary was intimidating and disrespectful and and not right they, they, they very well uh, will, will give some sort of a suspension mm. that is the hope that it doesn't doesn't um, go as far as the World Cup um, I think it would be harsh if that happened I think it needs to be addressed obviously and um, something will come out of it unfortunately I'm, I kind of know what the EPCR uh, disciplinary process I've been there a couple of times myself and um, you're kind of guilty until you, until you prove yourself innocent in that situation which is deemed unfair it's not the same in, in a court of law um, you have to prove your innocence and and mitigation. And um, if you wear a nice suit to the to the hearing nowadays, they say, well, you were very well presented and you were mannerly and all that. And we've seen lots of players getting their 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 bands reduced. So um, uh, look, ho- hopefully, hopefully it doesn't go and, and impact any of the games. But given Johnny's injury, um, given he's the captain of the side. Um, the hope would be that he plays in those those World Cup warm ups in August, but there's a real chance now that he may miss miss one or two of those. And sorry, do we need to see him play? Do you think, or is it because we've seen Sexton recover from injury at, at different times? There have been times where his form has been slow to come back, and there's other times where he's out for ages and it looks like he's never been away. So it's not nailed on that he he comes back exactly the way he was, particularly at this stage of his career, but. Um, you know, it's not a disaster, but at the same time, you kind of want to see him play, right? Yeah, I, I, I think we've seen many times him coming back from from being out for a period of time and and hitting the ground running. Um, we know he can do that. I think for himself um, and his own kind of match fitness, yes, you would want to get a couple of games under the belt, particularly for the Scotland South Africa game, but. Um, you know, he could very well use the, the Romanian game and the Tongan game to get him up to speed and, and, and ready for for South Africa and Scotland. So, but again, hypothetical, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, I don't think we need to see him play. I think for him and Ireland, obviously, it's a better situation if he gets minutes under his belt. And, uh, you know, our fingers are crossed, really, because... I think he he plays with his heart and his sleeve. He's very passionate. Um, and look, Roger won't mind me saying it. I always compare the two temperaments very similar. Um, Roger's had a few issues this year in the last season with with coaches on the sideline and referees, and they fight for their team. And I, I admire that for him, about him. But sometimes you've got to be careful. And Johnny's the same. He's pissed off. After losing the game, he's seen stuff that he thinks Jaco Piper missed or didn't give his team. Um, but we always trumpet rugby and say how great it is for that respect towards referees. And I was actually thinking at the weekend, and you know, um, if the Premier League soccer referees were mic'd up, some of the stuff you would hear from players and the abuse and the way they treat the referees is is shocking, really. And that's one of the big things about rugby. That you don't get that because you can hear the referee, you can hear him chatting to players, you can hear the referees like you know who who are calm and control and understand the game. That guys get emotional and they get hyped up and they can say things like if they feel that they're on their feet and it should have been their penalty and they they use a profanity or a bit of bad language towards the referee. 
it's taken in the right way in the sense that the referee can say, look, calm down and, and they kind of get a feel because they've played the game themselves and understand. Yeah. But you don't want referees kind of surrounded like it is in soccer. And I'm not saying Johnny did that, but he what he did probably, well, he, he knows it was wrong and it was it was there for everybody to see. Okay, we, and we'll see exactly what their defence is and I've no doubt the, the, the big gun lawyers will be wheeled out to make sure that uh, whatever the ban is, it's the least possible one. Quinny, good stuff. We'll talk to you again soon. Thanks a million. Cheers, cheers lads. So uh, Alan Quinlan giving us some thoughts on the rugby situation at the moment at 29 minutes past 8 this morning a reminder that OTBAM is live with Gillette Labs get the ultimate shave or your money back Neon Night Edition is available now uh, obviously Erasmus has done this to get into our heads says Bill Bobby um, if Sexton and Leinster was intimidating then that deserves to be punished says Danny Mac one and Graham Shaw says Paul O'Connell knows what a good second row is he got the ones he wanted I'm not too concerned about John Klein fetching up with South Africa are you? Mm, not particularly given that he as Quinny says is unlikely to be involved against us obviously if he was lining out against us or coming off the bench in that big game on September 23rd you, you would be concerned? No I'd be no? delighted if John Klein is if that means that like look at, no, look at it, all the players who so, aren't yeah of course there are players ahead of him in the pecking order but what I mean is you'd be concerned in a hypothetical scenario that he had an unbelievable game and you're like oh here okay there's that one time in history where Austin Healy provoked the Australian second row in the Lions whose name has suddenly escaped me in my moment of need having seen your moment here but that's the only time that I can remember anybody yeah. ever putting in one of those revenge performances and like uh, Austin Healy probably deserved it for the things did he yeah. call your man an ape is that what he did something something similar anyway in the column in the week before and like well, that's not a good idea but no one said anything bad about John Klein except that maybe he should have been in the squad and maybe he's not quite as talented on the ball but he's like got a lot of dog in him and that's what you would you know I don't know it, it is very but I, wouldn't easy. Be, I wouldn't be scared of him ripping us apart no maybe not something's gone horribly wrong if John Klein is the match winner for South Africa against Ireland it, 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 yeah correct but it, it's hard to um, it, it's hard to imagine a scenario where Razi Rasmus hasn't done this for for ulterior motives I'm sure there are reasons why he's brought him in and maybe looking for that little bit of insight as, as we said um, that's a very Razi Rasmus thing to do isn't it <laughs> Uh, Michael says Beyond the Pale is hosted on a very beautiful site and the production team are the same from the original Electric Picnic Mano Latuff Max Cooper Jape Thundercat Maribor State all worth checking out enjoy it Shane and Lance Malloy says go see Thundercat at Beyond the Pale and also Nigel Gatter says Beyond the Pale looks great ah, so very good I presume you're getting your tickets upgraded as we speak Shane Jesus if anyone from Beyond the Pale is listening and fancies doing that just shoot me a message don't know how they'd upgrade your uh, tickets no, it's um, already bought uh, what I'm not looking forward to is camping in a tent for three nights oh, there you go there must be some access all areas slash VIP slash access at jacks that work yeah glamping maybe would, would be an upgrade there you go yeah uh, right from the glamour of beyond the pale to the glamour of Donegal football politics I'm delighted to say Jason Byrne uh, GA correspondent with the Sun is with us this morning Jason good morning to you morning lads how are you um so we're going back to a story that has been rumbling for months and months and months. Um, essentially, this kind of all came to light when Carl Lacey stepped away and loads of the academy coaches, the vast majority of the academy coaches in Donegal stepped away at around about the same time. A couple of weeks ago, the report that was commissioned by Croke Park and the GEA um, was sent back to the relevant parties. It hasn't been published, although I do understand that um, you've had access to it and you've, you've seen what it, what's in it. And then last weekend, a statement was issued asking everybody to calm down and stop talking about this, even though there hadn't been that many people talking about it, which had a little bit of a Barbara Streisand effect where you're like, oh, I wonder what was said. So hence, we're here this morning wondering... What's going on? What, what what were the recommendations and what has been said that has been unhelpful so far? Yeah, it's an interesting one, Jerry. When that, when that statement came out last week, it, 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 was, uh, it was Kieran McLaughlin's name to it, the Ulster GA president who, who took part in the review. <clears throat> he just said that there was unhelpful comments in the media um, since the details of the report sort of emerged last week. But we're all still at a loss here um, in, in, in terms of what he was actually talking about. But I, I understand the local media in Donegal are quite um, put out by this uh, because the relations between themselves and the county border are at the floor, are on the floor at the minute, um, and Sydney, that's that's kind of been simmering for the last year or so. But um, yeah, like the the, the report, uh, the external review report was conveyed to, to clubs orally um, at a county convention meeting last week, and since then it's been sent to all the club secretaries. I understand so. They're going to have time to kind of chew on this now until the July county convention um, 
or county committee meeting takes place next month. So it'll be interesting to see what comes from that. But as you said, there's 14 uh, high risk elements uh, that have come from the report, and uh, you know three of them come under governance. Um, those are county convention rules, breaches of confidentiality, conflicts of interest. Then under the heading of finance, you have bank mandate and online banking, supporting documentation for payments, lack of regular financial reporting, and a functioning finance committee in place. Under audit, you have accounts not audited to financial standards and a dependence on the auditor. Under safeguarding, you have academy coaches safeguarding qualifications and academy coaches guard of vetting. And then under talent academy, you have uh, appointed interim academy lead group, post primary schools development and pressures and planning alignment for club schools and the academy. So this all kind of started summering uh, lads last year. Uh, a year ago, in fact, yesterday when, when Donegal were fairly heavily beaten by our man Clonus to end their championship. Declan Bonner uh, hung around for a few weeks as manager when the wide expectation was that he was going to go anyway. And then you have a huge lull there between Paddy Carr's appointment on October 24th. So that's all kind of summering in the background and the whole appointment process was very, very secretive. Uh, you had, you know, another maybe Barbara Streisand effect when you had Malachi O'Rourke being heavily linked with the job and then him saying he's not interested. Jim McGuinness's name was being bandied about as it, as expected. And then Rory Cavanaugh was expected to take the job and he got some units to the county final and after the county final he said he'd pulled out of the race. So Paddy Carr's then uh, unveiled senior manager and that's all kind of maybe a bit from left field. Rory Cavanaugh was the man expected to get the job. He didn't get the job. Then, uh, you know, everything's going great as far as we know with the academy. Carl Lacey does an interview with the, one of the local newspapers around December time, and he says that there needs to be greater links between the coaching officer and the academy. The county board seem to take umbrage with this. This rumbles on for another few months, and it subsequently leads to Carl resigning as head of the academy in February. And as you said, the coach, the coaches en masse support Carl, and they all leave, and that leads to the collapse of the academy. And then it all rumbles on for weeks and there's no academy and there's no young players playing football in Donegal and then you know all mediation attempts failed um, the county board are taking a kick in left right and centre and don't get me wrong there's lots of great people on the board who have dedicated huge amounts of their lives to this but just uh, you know what's transpired since has just been a very very sad situation and you know people are saying it's seeped into the senior dressing room and all that there and I wouldn't doubt that for a second but the bottom line is there's hundreds of young footballers in Donegal who have not kicked the Gaelic football at all this summer and you know they can go away they can they can go sign for Van Harps Derry City if, if they're talented down the soccer route they can go down different routes instead and you know we, we, this, the damage that this could do could, could, could be felt for years you know so um and then, like coming up to the, there was an EGM then, and uh, you know, two clubs called for resignations of two board officers, and uh, that was put on hold, uh, and because we were told that this external review was coming from Pro Park, so it'll be interesting to see if that comes back to the floor at county committee next month, and it'll be interesting to see what happens. But the bottom line is, all the clubs, a lot of them anyway, just want Carl Lacey reinstated as soon as possible. They want that rectified. And, um, you know, there's a huge need for change, change here. And I think one of the key findings from the report as well is that a chief uh, operating officer needs to be appointed for Donegal GA to kind of steer them through this and kind of start building again for the future. Um, because that's that's the most important thing here. It's a, it's a very, very sad mess. And, you know, hopefully the, the damage doesn't go on as long as, as it could. But, you know, there's been a lot of damage done, but it's time to start repairing and fixing things here and get the academy back up and running for the, for the good of Donegal GA. That's that's one of the the mad things, Jason. Is that like, look, there are good people in Donegal GA, there are great people in Donegal GA, um, but one one of the things that has been done well is is the academy and and the the academy that that Carl Lacey had set up. Uh, certainly, from the outside looking in, was was second to none. So it, it seems quite remarkable that he's the one that is not there anymore. Can you hear, us, Jason? I no. just lost Jason there. Yeah, you can hear us all right, can you? No, we're just having a bit of trouble with the line there. Um, so it, it, you, you're basing the fact that um, it was second to none on 
uh, the report actually has an appendix which includes mm. details of the structure of the academy and it is completely at odds with everything else that's in the report so the report has this uh, here is how everything has been run and um, we are very concerned about how everything has been run and then there's this other aspect to it which is the academy and we're saying there's incredible levels of detail uh, there's clarity on roles there's clarity on responsibilities there's clarity on, uh, clarity on outputs and how we're going to measure things mm -hmm. and the communication has been excellent so it, it is absolutely the clash of cultures where one is professionalism and progressive and the other and I, I actually don't blame the people involved uh, you know um, there's an overwhelming burden on administrators who are amateur in the GA but sometimes people are are incapable of seeing that their approach because this is how it used to be done is no longer fit for purpose in the modern day and I'd say there are many county boards who could really do with reading this report and it's unfortunate that it hasn't been published publicly it, like it's it's a it's a damning document but it's also a really important document in that um, and sorry we've, we've obviously seen the document at this stage mm. if, if you if you were to compare this to many other county boards, I suspect that you would you would find similar issues in in some of the county boards around the country. There are loads that are progressive, you know, and we know uh, the the progressive ones. They tend to bubble up. They they tend to ha to run great initiatives. They they tend to be the ones who uh, you hear about and who are proud to talk about the things that they're doing. But I, I think you need a professional whose job it is to um, manage the finances and the HR function and the back office function and the fixtures and all that kind of stuff. Jason, we're nearly out of time here, but I was just making the point there that um, I think um, Shane was making the point too. There's a clash of cultures between the professional, progressive nature of the well-communicated, well-thought-out, best-in-class plan for the academy and just the... the administrative arm of the county board which is still amateur and that's the problem in, in many of these cases is that um, the, the structures are no longer fit for purpose yeah, that's that's the point I was I was going to make there before the cut off there as well. Like, and you know, you have to remember as well when Carroll was a player, he was part of a Donegal squad that greatly improved standards in the county in terms of what was expected within the inter county dressing room at senior level. And you know, he's he's Donegal's most decorated player, and you know, he he brought those standards into coaching as has as have a lot of his teammates, like you know, Mark McCusen or his common now, you had um, Colin McFadden and Paul Durkin involved and in, and in, and. In, um, uh, Sligo as well and of course Rory Cavanaugh with St. Junins who, who won a county title with them in 2021 and came very close to, to doing back to back with them so like as you said it's when amateur volunteers in the GA clash with this high performance culture that now exists among inter-county players and coaches is when you know the standards that the, the coaches and the academies now require um, you know too many people are on too many different pages here so everyone kind of needs to meet in the middle it's it's it's, a, it's an interesting uh, kind of departure for the GA as a whole like where is this going to go like is, is this going to occur in other counties even though so many of the rest of them seem to have got their houses in order you take Offaly as a prime example look at them now like they're, they're flourishing and, and, and you know they're doing really well in both codes and they're on the rise big time so if you can get your house in order it can make a massive massive difference but it's just you know, Donegal just seemed to have lacked in that regard. Like I was talking to Manus Boyle, a legend of 1982, and he was saying that they learned nothing from 1982 and they went 19 years without an Ulster title and now he feels that they've, they've learned nothing again from 2012 because so many of our stars from that team should be in involved. Like Charlie running the academy was just ID. Yeah. And by all accounts, he was going to get the likes of Frank McGlynn and Paddy McGrath involved. And, you know, Michael Murphy retires as well and that doesn't help the situation and that leaves a big shadow in the senior dressing room. So just the whole thing, um, you know, it's, okay. it's just... It's just disappointing at the minute, but hopefully they can they can get it sorted and rebuild. But they need to get Carl back in to run that academy again. That's the bottom line. Jason, good stuff. Thanks a million for that. Uh, we did get a statement from. Yeah. Uh, so we, we, we obviously th th there's loads of issues in there that we didn't even get to, like the Donegal post primary schools lagging behind even the likes of Tyrone and, and Derry and Ulster, which is a, an issue, and even the the lack of fundraising initiatives in Donegal GA since December 2020. Uh, but we did get on to Donegal GA yesterday just to see if they, if they had any comment or their side of the story. And um, on behalf of Fergus McGee 
who's the Donegal GA chairman, uh, they wanted to point out that the Donegal Management Committee met for the first time last night since the review, uh, and they said the action items arising from the review will be discussed. At some point in the near future, we will give an interview, but for now we need time and space to begin the process as the report is only the guidelines to begin our work, which we are hopeful will lead to a positive outcome for the GA and Donegal. So that was their comments on the matter. All right, we'll uh, keep an eye on that one. At 8.43 this morning, a reminder, Brayburn Coffee is the official coffee partner of Off the Ball. Brayburn Coffee is coming to an Apple Green store near you. New Brayburn locations are popping up every month. Visit applegreenstores.com forward slash Brayburn to find your nearest Brayburn Coffee experience. There you go. That's it. Uh, John Duggan is with us. John, welcome back. Jar and Shane, how are we doing? Very good. Were you in Istanbul, Jar? I was. Did you enjoy it? Uh, I, thought, I mean, I really enjoyed the game. I did. I thought the Inter Milan were sensational. I thought that, um, you know, uh, it's an incredibly high level of football. Yes. <laughs> like, uh, John Stones, uh, before the game, I was like, isn't it mad that they don't just get a midfielder to do midfield things? And then as the game went on, I was like, oh, I might be wrong about that. <laughs> Turns out John Stones might be pretty good at this. Uh, but I, I, you know, I, I think, um, like, is Inzaghi going to be one of those great coaches in world football who kind of is unexpected that we we think he's going to get there and then all of a sudden I don't know I just thought that there were um, some little nuances to what they were doing that were really interesting it's amazing what you see in person as opposed to television yeah Mm. yeah now the game shouldn't have been in the Ataturk like it's too far out of town it's too difficult to get to Um, they didn't really look after the people who were at the game Um, how far out of town in terms well, of it's kind of hard because like town is obviously yeah metropolis. It's like a LA sized mm-hmm. uh, city, so there are there is a population center out there, but it's not where the fans were. It's not where the fan zones were. It, it took it's supposed to take an hour, mm-hmm. but it took three hours because the traffic was so bad and it wasn't managed properly. That's insanity. Wembley next year, Munich twenty twenty five. Munich, great. Wembley, I'd be a little <laughs> bit concerned. Yeah. A little bit concerned about what firework up the backside. You know, where where is that guy? We need to get him. <laughs> get him on the show. It's coming home. It's coming home. Yeah, I was in uh, I was in Limerick on Sunday, and after the week of disgusting coverage around golf and the greed and the skeevy nature of the way golf has gone at the altar of greed and money, to see these, I don't know, we kind of there's a degree of piousness for the Munster Hurling Championship and the amateur game and but to see 30 players who don't get a penny in the baking heat uh, throw up that spectacle was 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 beautifully part of Irish life and the colour of Irish life and uh, life can be brutally tough for everybody at times but it's one of those days where even going coming out of the train and walking over the Shannon uh, the bridge to uh, up to the Gaelic of Grands uh, you really feel it's Italian 90 for Limerick people oh the pitch invasion afterwards is sensational it's, it's like a proper homecoming had been planned <laughs> you, you can hear the music piping through some of the bars on the way and everybody's in their Limerick garb and their green jerseys and everybody's um, out there and, and the, there's a real belonging and an identity to it and they're having the best time of their lives oh, the, you're in, the video sorry. of the Limerick team bus even coming through with the, with the Garda yeah no, that's, like, that was uh, bad I got that I, I heard the I heard the sirens, and I said I know what this is, <laughs> and then I uh, Instagrammed it and put it on Twitter as well. Uh, I always would love to would love to be one of those motorcades. Uh, Tommy said that pre-match they had Paddy Casey and Sharon Shannon playing. Yeah, I miss that now. God, I don't like to go into matches too early. Um, I always like to just kind of slip in. And is it not a sign? Is it not non assigned seating, and so therefore you run a risk, or was it a sign seating? Uh, look, it was. Um, oh. <laughs> oh, it was a Jerry Goodroy. It was a Jerry Goodroy special. Oh, you had, good, you had the good seats, did you? Uh, you know, it was, it was okay. Oh. Say, there, there were issues for some people, and I, I noticed that on Twitter. There was, there was issues for some fans underneath the Mackey stand. Um, seemed to be a lot of um, bottlenecks. I do think pitch invasions are dangerous. Yeah, and uh, it. There was a kind of a half-hearted say. Look, the stewards kind of went around, and please don't, please respect the players. Don't go into the pitch. But you just knew there'd be an invasion. Yeah, you just knew it was going to happen. Uh, um, and do they still happen at all Ireland finals? No, 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 they don't. They don't. Park, they've yeah. been gone since yeah. like oh four, oh three, oh four, around that period. There were cases taken, and then Croke Park decided, and we're not paying any more money for this. Well, like, no, the trophy presentation is going to be. Cause there was the period where the trophy presentation was on the pitch when yes. they were redoing the stands, and then they never came back after that because I think there's, there might have been one or two where the you know Plan B, 
Yeah, plan not, B. Not yeah. proposal yeah. B. Yeah. Plan B. Yeah. Um, and that's can't talk it. about proposal B anymore. I don't know. I, don't, I can't remember who, what fans did that. I mean, obviously there was the Loud fans getting on the pitch after Loud Meath. Yeah. But uh, that was uh, so just, that was a different type of pitch invasion. Not not one of joy. No, no. Uh, no, no, three, the last one. I me- but they, they were uh, iconic uh, images. The Armagh ones, remember, there's the Sea of Orange. The year before, yeah. It was down at Mount Julia that weekend. Um, but yeah, but I can't remember that many recently. But yeah, it doesn't seem to apply to county grounds as, as much. So look, they might need to just tighten that up a bit. If Mayo won in All Ireland, I, like, well, that's is it. anything going to keep their fans off the pitch? Nathan well, Murphy on the on the pitch, and then, Cameron Hill. I think I don't think there's going to be a pitch invasion again in Croke Park because people have accepted that actually the the players' right to go and do their lap of honour yeah. is something. The players' right to spend time with their families on the pitch trumps your rights to slap them on the back do you know yeah yeah like fair. it's like um, well, I'm I'm the most important one here it's like well maybe we should like let everybody have access to the players but particularly the family members and as John says they're amateurs like um, so I, I don't know I, I think Croke Park have got that right when it comes to not having the pitch invasions you feel like Limerick are almost like the dubs in their run at the moment remember the dubs always found a way in tight games it's incredible that they've had 12 finals under John Cotty and won the lot yeah I, I, I'm I of the law of diminishing returns on this one I think yeah. they're going to get caught this year they're going to get caught yeah. I, that's my that's my I, I, I was looking at the prices of uh, Kilkenny Tipperary all the way through well Kilkenny were 9-2 to two before the I was like that's a great price at least to reach the final each way you get your money back to reach the final all they got to do is get over Galway and you're like oh, I, I didn't do it stupidly caught by, it. but they have to be caught by a Galway or Tip team that have battered through each other do you know this is assuming, of course, Tippy Doffley. That's the bad result for Galway. You know, you look, 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 look. Had to regroup now, Henry Sheffield and the players after that. Yeah. Ooh. Um, Claire, how much have they got in the tank? I don't know. Um, last year, I felt Claire died in their shields. This year, I felt Claire. Forget about the free. I think they had enough chances to, to win the game. They should have been much further ahead at half time. They lost the third quarter by eight points. Um, and they didn't make the changes in the full back line uh, as soon as they should have. Was it Malachi Clerken writing yesterday that if Claire meet Limerick again in the All Ireland this year, Claire will win? He was saying it with fairly uh, a fair degree of certainty. But I think a lot of people have kind of come across that. Uh, theme of opinion that you know players have learned their mistakes from well, well they beat them of how course how much do they have in the tank is is the is the key mm. how much have they got to, to now they probably have Dublin and in order to respect to Dublin you'd expect them to beat Dublin um, will Conor Cleary be back how much have they got left in terms of reserves because the Munster Championship as we know is brutal um, and it's been a, a brilliant brilliant spectacle but um, it's very hard for me I don't know about you guys it's very hard for me to call a winner I have to say in both coats at the moment mm. As in an overall winner. Yeah, who's going to win the both the hurling and the football? I've no, like I, I can't say with any kind of like it's not, most years you go, oh, Kerry going to do it this year, the Dubs or not. This is Kilkenny's year, or Limerick's year, but this year I find it very difficult to call. Are you leaning any direction in particular in both? I uh, go away in the football. I'll be leaning and uh, the hurling. I do think Tipperary could be there thereabouts. Right. Uh, there are some bits of news that we need to get through quickly. Yeah. Um, Killing Mbappe has said that yeah. he's not going to. He it, uh, he obviously has it's a two way contract option. Yeah. So he's got one more year left that's guaranteed, uh, and then after that there's nothing. So uh, he would then therefore be free to go next season. Yeah, and it seems like PSG from the reports, um, BBC reporting that they might want to cash in. It feels to me that the PS the Qatari thing at PSG is kind of done, and they've had their Galacticos era, and Messi's left, and Neymar will probably leave where he'll go. Who knows? Probably Saudi. Mm-hmm. Um, and Real Madrid want Mbappe Benzema's left how much will it be 200 million um, I think he's going to leave this summer I would have to say um, could he end up in the Premier League well if the, say if the Qataris bought Man United um, possibly but who wants to live in Manchester as opposed to Madrid um, the Denver Nuggets won the NBA uh, beat Miami Heat 94-89 uh, they're owned by Stan Kroenke of Arsenal fame He's, also he's won it all now yeah. except the Premier League he won the uh, NFL obviously with, um, with LA and now he's done this and he is the husband of Anne Walton um, Gronky who's the, an heiress to Walmart who also owned the uh, Denver Broncos he just bought the Broncos so 12 billion um, Jonathan Liu is worth reading folks today about the Saudis and golf and it's just come out in the Guardian it's uh, one of those Jonathan New masterpieces. I'll just quote just before I go. Um, just this is just 
like <laughs> sorry uh yeah 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 so john to lou <laughs> do do, do. Where is talk the amongst yourselves yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's like the cra- it's like the crappy quiz the, the wider the significance here pauses. the wider significance here is the concussive speed and devastating lack of transparency which with the transaction was concluded this is the pj thing the way intractable obstacles were simply bulldozed or bought away the utter indifference to public opinion outcry backlash this may be the story of how saudi arabia buck off but really it's a blueprint for what they want to do with everything else and he finishes with um, you will not be kept up to date on progress as ever you'll find out what's happening whenever it decides you need to know yeah I think that's the point that the golf thing like oh, how much further will it go with golf that's done now they'll move on like there's, there's another there's another thing which will be of more importance and um, it could be anything like it could literally be anything mm. it could be off the ball they might actually buy off the ball well uh, yeah, I for one welcome our new as um, <laughs> <laughs> Richie was pointing out uh I'd been talking to Miguel Delaney after the game about our difficulty of, of getting to the ground and he had written a piece about the City fans and they had absolutely horrific difficulty there was a guy with his 77 year old dad who had a hip operation who had to walk for hours and hours and hours and they had no water and he was the one who had seen the, the puking on the bus and the uh, pissing out the window and stuff and I had, I had a tiny little description and Johnny Lou came back and went briar infested scrubland stone wall and open sewer arguably a harder route to the final in Porto Benfica Milan so he's a he is a funny guy but also a um, very talented writer so check that out today John good stuff right, lads. See it. more from JD of course on Saturday afternoon on Off the Ball on News Talk we're uh, turning our attention back to tennis I'm delighted to say Conor Nyland is with us to reflect on uh, Novak Djokovic's ascendancy to the throne as the greatest ever even I can't deny this anymore Conor um, his record is unimpeachable and he, he's not finished at all no no he's not he's got another few left in him good morning I was listening to you lads talk about it. Jonathan Lee there he wrote a great article in The Guardian a couple of days ago about the win as well. As you say, ascending to the throne and in Nadal's house, you know, it was it was obviously Djokovic versus Kasper Ruud, but it was, it was Djokovic versus Nadal in terms of the slam numbers and to do it in, in on Chatrier at the French where Nadal's been so dominant was sort of ironic and I'm sure pretty sweet for Djokovic. His story is so long that I had forgotten significant aspects of it, which I was only reminded of recently watching the Boris Becker documentary. Um, After Becker retires, there's a period uh, where he becomes a coach, where he's like, uh, he's actually in Djokovic's box for a couple of seasons. And it's quite important in like uh, you'd forgotten that there was a flakiness in, in Djokovic Andy Murray would beat him and could outlast him and it was it was in the mix who would win between Murray and Djokovic on clay now, obviously that's the testimony to how great a player Andy Murray was but it does seem as if there were staging posts along the way that have been important in terms of turning him into the psychological power that he is that's it like he was he was pulling out of matches a lot and it's interesting when you think of kind of what happened with Alcaraz like Alcaraz was was nearly the story of the tournament up until that one love in the third set against Djokovic when he started cramping kind of out of nowhere he was he was incredible he has been incredible the last few months um, and, and was uh, dismantled sits a bass in a way um, that I haven't really I haven't really seen a a, a player like Alcaraz I feel like in, in, a, in a long time um, but as you say his body is letting him down a little bit at that early stage in his career and we saw it a lot with Djokovic um, sort of between the ages of say 18 and 21, 22 even so hopefully Alcaraz can sort of settle down into that period and, and maybe start to get a bit of momentum and maybe take a little bit of a run at some of these records he's got a long way to go though um, but yeah Djokovic had, had Becker on board for a couple of years I like Becker actually helped him a lot with his serve he was known as an unbelievable returner, ground stroker, mover, but he brought, I think he brought his serve on quite a bit. Um, and it's now, it's now a weapon, has been for about five or six years. So uh, the full package. And I think he o- always found Roland Garros the hardest to win. Obviously, Nadal was a huge component to that. But like he's now do- got the Aussie this year and the French. He's always had a nice kind of a run at Wimbledon and the US Open. He sort of liked that that two or three months. Um, and it didn't take that much out of him physically, as I said, with the way the Alcaraz match finished. Uh, and obviously the Rude match was was relatively straightforward. Um, so I would have thought pressure off now. He's got that number, the 23, uh, and he's got to 
you know, maybe have a tilt for the counter slam just to top it off. Wouldn't put it past him. That's the thing, Connor, isn't it? Like, and that's the scary thing for his opponents is that that calendar Grand Slam it gives him extra motivation. Like, it's the third time I think he's ever won those first two tournaments or Grand Slams of the year. He really, really wants to achieve that. Yeah, I'd say I'd say he'd love it as just a, an exclamation point. Um, yeah, I don't think there's going to be a, a kind of a relaxing uh, having won that and then kind of gotten that that box ticked. I suppose of the twenty three, I think he's going to push on. That's just the type of type of competitor he's been. Um, body body wise, he looks pretty good. As I say, there was no like he was duffed up a couple of times by Nadal. He looked like a he looked like a kind of a bruised and battered guy uh, after the French Open the last few years but this one he's come out kind of gleaming as I say sitting on his throne um, and has a nice lead in now for three weeks to Wimbledon and uh, yeah he'll be ready to go he seems to have come out the other side of all the, the controversies and the the vaccine stuff uh, almost with a, a siege mentality like has, has that just almost propelled Djokovic into a, into this level considering he's 36 and, and people would say you know he, he should be tapering off at this stage but it's nearly given him a, a new lease of life in some weird ways yeah I think you're right I think he's probably settled in his own head that he, he isn't going to be loved and he is a little bit of a he is a divisive figure and he's got the Serbian sort of fans that come out in force that I think know that as well um, and are there to sort of back him up in any fight any dog fight he's in in, 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 in any stadium um, so yes like if you think about Australia where we were um, 2022 and, and him not being able to play he's in uh, you know he's in a confinement uh, hotel uh, he's had the the match at the US Open the year before where he's been disqualified He's still a couple of um, slams away from from getting to where Nadal is going to get to. Uh, so to think he's turned it around um, uh, and is sitting pretty at 23 with Federer obviously out of the picture. Nadal, it sounds like he'll he'll hopefully get out to to some of the bigger tournaments next year. But it sounds like he possibly won't be a force, um, and everyone, no one else is anywhere close. So he's just he's kind of playing with house money now for the next what. But you'd have to think at least 18 months he's going to be an absolute um, not a not a, not a favourite necessarily with Alcaraz around but certainly one of the top two or three at every slam um, so yeah it's going to be interesting to see if, if Alcaraz can sort of improve if he's going to be a bit of a blocker for Nadal or sorry for Djokovic to maybe get to the to the mid-20s or even high-20s scary as that sounds where is Djokovic in that gold conversation for you with Federer and Nadal? Like, it, does it solely come down to, to numbers and him being ahead of the two of them in, on Grand Slams now, or is it is it more nuanced than that? Maybe. Yeah, I mean, I don't like how the the, the whole goat debate has been pretty reductive to to just Grand Slams. Like, I know Johan Borg was complaining um, a few years ago. I remember that you know he used to go and win, kill himself to win the Italian Open because it was a massive event, and then turn around and win the French and. Uh, uh, and Wimbledon that, that was an incredible achievement and nobody necessarily went down to Australia um, whereas that's changed and, and, and Djokovic has won or was it 10 10 Australians give or take so that is a big um, I suppose change in terms of how the debate has been framed it's just Grand Slam numbers um, but I think any way you look at it I saw a graphic the other day where he's got uh, I think the most weeks at ATP number one most Masters Series titles. Um, he's won, I think, the most year-end year end number ones. I think is seven. I think Sampras was six. Um, so, you know, he's out there. It's very, very hard to, very, very hard to look past. I, I, it is very hard to look past at this stage. I mean, I'd love to make the case for uh, Federer or Nadal. Um, both Federer and Nadal had, had periods where they looked... Um, like they were coming to the end like you kind of see it especially with Federer the injuries began to take a toll with Djokovic that hasn't been the case the only thing that has prevented him from playing has been disqualification for yeah. you know hitting the ball boy with the ball or uh, because he refused to uh, take vaccines um, like there has been no sense of physical decline at all has there? No I mean well I mean he, he sort of had this I issue in Australia um, and, and it looked like after I think it was the third round was it his hamstring um, and he sort of hobbled over the line and he looked like he was really minding himself for for um, a match or two but managed to get through it just because of his level and then 
thanked his team, his physio, at the end of the two weeks, saying that they had done you know an unbelievable amount of work behind the scenes to get him right. Um, so there has been a couple of a couple of nat- naturally a couple of kind of niggles that have come come through, but there was nothing at all during the French. Um, I think he'll inevitably get something, but I, I I agree there isn't. You know, you felt like with Federer, even he looked a little bit older, whereas Djokovic kind of lo- he looks the same as he did ten years ago. The way he moves, there's no there's been no compromise in his game. I guess is probably the way to describe it. He's playing the same game that he did uh, when he was 25. Um, he's not trying to shorten points or, or, or try to be a bit more aggressive or do anything differently. Um, so, yeah, it's it's amazing. But, like, it's funny, the lead-up to this tournament, like, he lost, I think it was the second round of quarterfinals of a, an, an ATP 250 in Bosnia to Dusan Lojevic, you know. So, um, it, he he's dipping in and out. You know, you don't see him between the slams a whole lot. So he's doing what Federer did um, for a few years where he was just really, really peaking for the slam. So that's obviously what's, what he's going to be doing over the next couple of years. But uh, yeah, it'll be interesting to see where he ends up. But it's it's probably not going to be a 23 where he is right now. We've been talking in the aftermath of Serena finishing about the women's game and, and who needs to step up. It does appear as if Schwantek is is the one who's uh, bubbled up. I mean, obviously, there's still room for Coco Goff and we really hope that Emma Raducanu solves all of the various myriad of issues that she has to try and, um, you know, push on and, and give everybody something to look forward to. But is Schwantek on the verge of being like absolutely dominant or is she just a little bit ahead of everybody at the moment and, and as a result winning these titles and picking them up because there is nobody totally dominant yeah I would say she's more than a little bit I, you know I would say she's she's, um, she's there's a definitely a gap between her and the rest of the field I think what's helped her though is Ash Barty retiring um, and, and Naomi Osaka both out of the pic- both out of the picture now um, both sort of choosing as opposed to walk away from, from tennis and that um um I suppose, yeah, I, I always find that amazing that, that Barty, Barty walked away at, at 25 and Osaka sort of chose not to um, try and become one of the greats um, because they both had the potential to do it. So that has opened up a bit of a pathway for Sri and she's, yeah, really focused. It seems like it's her it's her number one thing in her life, um, which is obviously what's required. Um, so, yeah, it's just whether she can put it together now for five, six, seven years or... 10 plus years like Serena I think that seems to be the, the typical thing for, for players these days for whatever reason um, it, it seems like the on the ladies side they're finding it difficult to to go and put 15, 16 year careers together uh, it seems like they, they burn right for 4 or 5 years and, and get a little bit tired or disillusioned or distracted or something um, and they're not able to put these incredible kind of careers together like we saw when Navra- going back to say the Navratilova Everett sort of days all the way through to Serena I was reaching a point there Connor. I was thinking you know the, the, the peak age of tennis we spoke to Jenny Claffey about this last week as well the peak age was getting more and more like what is a record 11 Grand Slams in his 30s for Djokovic but then you see the likes of Sviantec at 22 and, and Alcaraz at 20 and you wonder like which, which way is it is it headed is it, is it a bit of both like you, you kind of feel with sports science developing the way it is players will be able to play a little bit longer but, but then you see players at the peak of their powers potentially in Sviantec and, and, and Alcaraz so it's hard to know which way it's headed yeah I mean I, I read something during the week about Djokovic that he's in that maybe that sweet spot of having all that incredible experience and not um, and not having a real fade physically and as I say I think that that fade comes quite quickly um, from maybe 36 37 to 40 um, but right now he's in a bit of a he's in a good place where he's got you know some of the stats you see that, that roll around during these tournaments in terms of how many say Grand Slam semi-finals he's played, and if you think he's won twenty-three, how many Slam semi-finals, how many times he's been in that situation. So I think that helps massively. Um, like it was interest, interesting that watching the start of the the final against Rude, um, like Djokovic got off to a really slow start. It's almost like he's so comfortable and relaxed in those situations. Sometimes he finds it difficult to know exactly which gear to start in. And he can be, I think he's so used to it being, knowing he's got this three, four hour window to win the match and, and sort of so confident in some ways that he can be quite slow. And he almost played with fire a little bit against Rude and was down 4 1. Um, so sometimes it can work against him. But yeah, it's, um, it, yeah, it, it, I, don't, I don't know why, say, the guys are, are seem to be able to put together these careers and, and seem to say, have that hunger 
um, and and an ability to keep going well into their thirties, whereas the ladies are, um, you know, a little bit more focused on on winning slams in their early twenties, and then kind of mid to late twenties are, are are a little less seem to be a little less engaged. Attitude seems to be so important as well. Kind of like when you look at the likes of the, those younger players. I was reading a story during the week of Iga Swiatek when she was eighteen. Uh, you know, four years ago, making a bet with her sports psychologist. You know that she couldn't go through one training session without any drama, and she was just in this period where she was consistently having issues at, at training sessions. Alcaraz as well now, all of a sudden, is a player that just plays with a smile on his face, as does Swiatek at this stage. So it's clearly something that that the younger players have taken on board that you need to you need to enjoy the sport and not have the tantrums that that lead to I guess the the sport becoming a, a negative part of your life yeah I, think I love Alcaraz's um, attitude um, you know if you look at Nadal Federer these guys they kind of all don't bring a lot of baggage with them um, which I think helps and if you look at Holger Rune who's a, a, another talent who I really really I think is a massive upside and, and is winning Master Series now is, Master Series now at say 19 years of age which sort of would suggest he's tracking towards being a Grand Slam champion over the next two or three years he does have a little bit of um, drama that he brings which I think it, it never helps ultimately um, there's so much going on and so much there's so many fights to fight in tennis that bringing your own um, creating your own sometimes can uh, can overcomplicate things and, and it's a waste of energy so um, yeah controlling um, so it's your your own mental state is is, is absolutely key and Sviantec one of the few players who travels with a sports psychologist um, which is interesting I think she's a really close friend as well um, and, it, and it seems to have really helped her sort of make that transition from being say winner of Junior Wimbledon breakout winner of the French three, four years ago uh, and they're starting to pull together a, you know, a collection of Grand Slam titles so she's navigated that that really, really well. I always find it interesting Sviantec often says in her in her interviews you know, I'm from Little Old Poland you know, we don't have a huge history of tennis um, but then I'm like, well, Radwanska made final Wimbledon in 2012 and Jersey Tanovich made semis of Wimbledon in 2014 um, but she, she certainly plays the the role of somebody who's sort of just trying to figure all this out um, and perhaps is, is sort of trying to, to dampen expectations a little bit when she says that. Naomi Osaka says she will come back after she has her baby and she wants her kids to see her play um, tennis at a high level so hopefully that's the inspiration that uh, drives a rivalry because the, ten- the, the women's game needs a bit of the rivalry to replace what Serena obviously brought with the box office? Tennis needs rivalries. It's 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 lifeblood for whatever reason. Um, you, you have to have it. Um, so um, going back to McEnroe Borg and, and all the way through the Agassi Sampras, the Becker Edbergs, um, and obviously we had an incredible run with the, the three slash four guys, including Murray. Um, so the women's game has suffered massively, I think, in the last decade from from a lack of that. I think Serena's star power um, and I suppose her uniqueness uh, in terms of how good she was carried carried the WTA through kind of a rocky period, and now we're in a bit of a yeah a period where I think we need we need a few more names, a few more rivalries. I think Raducanu would have been poised. I think that would have been would have been absolutely fantastic for her to say take up a position in the top three to five in the world and, and be competing. But it just looks like that is not happening for her. Um, and I'd be concerned that she is, you know, not going to be able to consolidate a position in the top 10 yeah. with the injury trouble she's had. And I don't know, just, she's just not putting it together. All right, Connor, we'll leave it there for now. Good stuff. Thanks a million. Great to have you with us. Cheers, guys. It's Connor Nyland there. I was just um, on the, uh, I was Googling how difficult it is to get tickets for the men's US Open mm. Uh, single semi-finals tickets still available at Flushing oh, really? Meadow um, what's that the, later in the year that's, September that's the last one Friday September the 8th so if 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 it's going to be like the historic and you want to be there to boo uh, you know <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's not ridiculous money to go what about like it yourself 300 no that's the same weekend Ireland playing France of course in the football yeah 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 so yeah. Um, you can't, can't, can't knock out to Paris for that right yeah, it's Rugby World Cup time as well, isn't it? Just yeah. before. So it's, sorry, that's the opening weekend of the Rugby World Cup, actually. Romania, that weekend. Yeah. Um, uh, France playing the All Blacks, I think, in Paris. It's the same, the night after we play, the, it's the soccer, we're playing Parc de France in there, in the Stade de France. Yeah, but tickets, 300 quid, $300, flights, another 500 if you want to go. Just, anyway. 
chance of a lifetime, folks. 12 minutes past nine this morning here on OTBM. We'd love to hear from you. 087 980 180 is the WhatsApp number. Some highlights for you on the podcast network today, the Koi Gig podcast. Uh, the latest episode is available now. There's a football pod with uh, a little bit of um, uh, Vegas sunshine blitzed in and Rugby Daily, of course with Richie after the ads coaching expert Colin Alley will be live in studio talking about his new book but first the cash machine off the balls summer cash machine the uh, summer cash machine is here we're in the midst of another hot winning streak we've now had five winners in a row Caroline Murphy became the latest winner on Monday when we called and she had the number written down taking parts easy every day we give you an amount you take note of it enter and if it's you we call tell us the amount you win the cash the summer cash machine has been reloaded it's 20,582 euros and 31 cents to enter text OTB to 57557 if it's you we call after 3 o'clock on Tuesday June 13th that's today you answer your phone within five rings and tell us the prize amount and you win the money got to be over 18 to enter Cost is 250 plus your standard message rate to play. You play across the Go Loud network of stations. Full terms are on our website at offtheball.com. So you've got to get your entry in by 3 o'clock on Tuesday, the 13th of June. The cash machine then randomly picks one entry, and it could be you we call. If you answer within five rings, tell us the prize amount. The cash is yours. The number again, 20,582 euros and 31 cents. Text OTB to 57557. Back after these. Off the Balls Summer Cash Machine. Three, two, one, go. Whether you're a Drive to Survive fan or a Grand Prix expert, now you can stay up to date with the world of F1. The F1 pod on Off The Ball with Chicago Town Pizza, the ultimate podcast for F1 fans. The F1 pod will keep you on the edge of your seat. For the best insight and analysis, subscribe to the Off The Ball daily podcast feed wherever you get your podcasts. The F1 pod on Off The Ball with Chicago Town Pizza. Formula One? Yeah, we go to town on it. OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition, available now. We're, we're going to be hosting a big night of celebration for the Republic of Ireland Women's National Team in partnership with Sky. It's coming your way on the 28th of June in the Mansion House in Dublin. Check out Add Off The Ball on Twitter to find out how to win tickets to this exclusive event. Sky, proud primary partners of the Republic of Ireland Women's National Team. Now, Colin Alley is with us in the studio. Colin, how are you? Oh, grand Jaren yourself thank you yeah, very much for so the, the invite you have a new book out it's called GA Football Training 10s and uh, it's 10 different uh, exercises for coaches to um, improve loads of different aspects of the game it's like bite size and easy it's actually I kind of I remember collecting tokens from the Avonmore milk back in the <laughs> 80s and there were small books like this but yeah. they, we seem to have gone away from them into the more kind of in depth um, so this is uh, filling the gap in the market well um, it, it would have been road tested, uh, Jerry, in that like that's my my third uh, book, and basically uh, coaches, the feedback and coaches, they want something handy, something practical, something that fits in the glove department, yeah. something that they can bring with them. And what I try to do is I try to align it with the um, current coaching process that's out there. Like the award ones and the award twos are broke down into seven or eight different modules: um, technical proficiency for improving skills, tactical plies and stuff like that, warm ups, physical fitness. So I try to um, align it with that, giving ten um, ideas for coaches uh, along along the coaching process that's out there from the. Okay, so it, it, it's a brilliant companion to uh, anybody who is actually at the moment going through that process of becoming an accredited coach. Yeah, and um, like... I kind of I'm reluctant to call it a coaching book because um, it's it's more of a coaching content book because coaching as you, mm. as you well know it makes up there's a lot of um, facets to go with coaching this is just one of them like um, and like that's what I do I just I share content I share um, ideas but I don't tell people how to coach I, because you know there's too many variables in that when it comes to building rapport connections t- tactical stuff and all that sort of stuff so this is just part of the coaching pie as I call it How do you think we're doing at the moment um, let's specifically stick to, to Gaelic football, right? Mm-hmm. How are we doing in terms of the evolution of our thought processes about uh, getting as many coaches as possible to feel empowered to think, okay, I'm actually going to go coach the way I want to because I have a vision mm-hmm. about how the game should be played, but at the same time, I'm going to give everybody the skills required to be able to think for themselves. How, how are we doing? What's your... Yeah, well, I do think, um, I, think we've a, I think we have an excellent coaching process. Like, there's kind of four parts of the official coaching process. You have your um, child safeguard and you've got your introduction to Gaelic games and your award one and award two. 
to. So there's something there for everybody who wants to go and coach at a certain level. Not everybody wants to go to the elite level. People just want to follow their son or daughter to a certain level and uh, it's up to the GA to try to provide something for that. So there's something there for everybody. Now the big issue that I would have with it is it's the follow through is that when you go and you do your course you're back at your club and nobody checks on your needs after that to come back to see to make sure that each team has a, um, a coach with the relevant qualifications you know because that's very very important it's particularly with all the debate that's going on at the minute with the go games and things like that so all that's covered in the courses but it's the, it's the follow through to make sure that the principles picked up in the courses are being adhered to and put into place so I'd have a bit, bit of an issue with that there's brilliant um, initiatives going on at the moment like there's um, there's core modules being developed I'm part of them through Crow Park where you're developing certain workshops that's going to assist coaches who don't want to become an elite coach but want a little bit more information so for instance there's myself um, Jack Cooney and Maggie Farley we're, we're working on a workshop about um, defending with an extra player so that's just a three hour bespoke workshop that coaches can attend to and get some ideas on how to coach a defensive setup or break down a defensive setup so these are really exciting they're being piloted at the moment and will be rolled out shortly You mentioned the go game stuff where do you stand on the competitiveness for, for young players like, I guess parents living vicariously through their through their kids is another issue as well um, yeah I, I kind of like just was preparing for that a little bit like like the go games is common sense to me it, it's it's brilliant it's the development stage of players uh, and it's so important so if if um, competitiveness has shown that um, you don't get enough game time well then there's a problem with that it has to be game time for everybody now I think we're very hard on ourselves here in the GA because the go games are on the go for about 20 years now and they've been a massive success but in saying that I would say this that the, um, the policy informs the practice but the practice should also inform the policy so in other words if there is um, if you're getting feedback and finding out that children at a younger age are more able for competitiveness then that feedback has to be taken on board and you, you know something has to be, has to be it, come from that you have to follow through on it and get to get mm. the um, get the opinions of the coaches that are on the ground the biggest issue another issue there that I have is a lot of people that are commenting on this and actually um, coming up with ideas they've no boots on them they're not on the pitch they're not there with um, 38 year olds running around the pitch you know they're coming out of college and, and they have degrees about what's the right practice in that to get qualified in something you have to live it you have to coach mm. a load of boys and girls at 7 and 8 years of age 9 to 10, 11 to 12, before really. So that's why I'm saying if the practice can inform the policy, like if you get good feedback from the coaches that are on the ground to say, look, these 10 year old boys are a little bit more capable of this or that and the other. And if they are, they are. I can tell you this everybody says that children um, you know, are well aware of the score of the match and what it means to win or lose. They're also well aware that when you give them five minutes towards the end of the game, that you as a coach don't rate them and you don't think much of them. And that's a bigger indictment to me than, than everything else. So, so for me, the goal games are, are massive and it's a massive. Um, for, for development we're a community based organisation we have to provide games for all look early engagement for me is better than early specialisation so if you, what happens in the GA and what we do best is people come down and they feel part of the club from a young age and that's a, a huge success I'd be a big um, advocate of children playing as many sports as possible mm. that's called sampling and when you sample lots of different sports you pick up lots of different motor movements you pick up lots of different skills that can be utilised in the game but ultimately you'll go back to what you love most and that's the, what I always said with my boys I have three boys now who played loads of different sports I'd always say to them play what you love play what you love at the end of the day and that's what they do and I think that's what happens and I think we do that better than most in, 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 uh, sporting organisations in GA we get the engagement we, we you know they're, they're welcomed we give games to them all you know it, there is a problem and maybe the coaches need to be um, vetted a little bit more on who's with teams and that because that's that's my view on it I, I think the go games are a no brainer hugely important for development of we're coaching we're coaching people that play football play GAA so you know to be involved in something to be empowered to feel part of something is massive as well yeah so it sounds like there's loads of stuff there um, we need to continue the coaching development uh, as much as we possibly can and we need to make sure that when people finish the course or even are in part of the course that they're actually being able to use what they've learned in the application and then yeah. when they have done that we need a feedback loop to be able to come and say actually I found these bits don't work for me but these bits really are working for me I think so I think there has to be a channel where you feed up as well as feedback right so again you, you look lots of counties have, have great games programs and they might find that at a certain age they're more ca capable of sort of being gone down the competitive route and and so be it get that information back there to the policy makers and, and have a look at it um, I think to that um, what happens is like we're, as I said, we're a community-based organisation. Our coaching process, there's no pass and fail in it. 
and I agree with that there shouldn't be a pass and fail because if somebody's willing to give up three evenings a week or two evenings a week to coach their children the last thing you want to say is well you failed to award one you can't coach mm, yeah. right? it's not about that so it's about giving them as much information that you can that they can provide good enough sessions look I would say to everybody here that's coaching children right? the first thing I would say is if you're in doubt and if you haven't if you're struggling to plan your session you play a game because that's the feedback if you stood back there and say to the kids I'll be out with you in five minutes they'll go and they'll put two um, jackets down and they'll start playing a game there might be a game of soccer or something but yeah. they'll start playing a game <laughs> so that's feedback to you as a coach that they're down here to play games so play games as early as possible yeah yeah okay um, are we also in danger and I'm talking more about the elite side of it now of being um, I, I feel there's a little bit of culture of being anti-coaching that we're like uh, coaches who coach outside their the parish in which they were born are somehow you know bad yeah. that's like you're, you're, you're a dodgy geezer you're going somewhere who the hell do you think you are to try and improve yourself I'm like every other culture really embraces coaching as like a as a profession first off like every high school in America has a a coach like we're really struggling still to implicate PE at second level and that's where we should have done this decades ago yeah. but anyway we didn't we're slightly improving now with all the um, the fact that you can study it although I still haven't quite seen the figures coming through yet for a massive surge in recruitment of PE teachers and that, that we, there's this kind of antipathy towards anything that anybody who's thought too much about this well they're not you know that's not the mm-hmm. true spirit of, of amateurism I'm like well uh, do we have to be amateur in everything can we not like take a professional approach to being amateur I don't know what do you think of that yeah I, I know what you're saying and I, I can only really um, speak of my own journey so it's like, like I don't work full time uh, within Jay and I don't want to and the simple reason is because it consumes me so if, if I was working full time with this like it'd be, it's already nearly 24-7 in my mind right so if, if, if I was working at it then I feel I'd get burnt out and I wouldn't be passionate about it but like that when I started out in my coaching journey like I, I was coaching very very young even from my first club in O'Dwyer's and my bringing I would take the warm ups for the senior team I would do things like that and then when I moved to New Town Blues when I got married um, I was player manager at 32 for the, for the team I, I always had an interest in coaching this but basically because I was a goalkeeper right and you were just left aside kicking balls and someone would throw a few high balls at me and I, I wanted more so I had to go and source information mm. could I become better what, what should I do so I found out there was loads of different resources there like I've studied at Satanta College I've done um, a hard diploma in strength and conditioning I don't want to be a strength and conditioning coach but I want to be able to talk to a strength and conditioning coach and not be bamboozled by yeah. the jargon so there is um, a lot of people out there that are better than themselves through um, all these things that are their online courses um, you, you, DCU were, were one of the first to start um, looking at strength and conditioning coaches and giving degrees and that so they had to go somewhere so they've all come out and they've all started um, being involved in GEA teams but you're right there's nothing wrong with that um, for people wanting to better themselves um, the GEA only offers a certain amount to award two which is, is meant to be geared to inter-county teams minor 21s and stuff like that but after that there's lots of different information like um, Fergus Connolly runs a course from America people, a team sports masterclass mm. people are doing stuff like that so there's loads and loads of information out there and, and like that you're right um, people want this information and they're sourcing it I, I find sometimes right like I coach in my club Newtown Blues um, I'd say I've co- coached with them for about 20 years but there's not one pl- person in that club with all due respect that listen to me anymore they've heard all my jokes they've heard all my coaching things. so you have to go and, and recreate that somewhere else you have to go and learn more right and that's that, that's part of that's self-awareness that's you being aware of that we more. should encourage that though it's like oh without doubt you know it's the sharing of information it's the discovery of new it's curiosity well, I, I was saying out there right to keep something you got to give it away and that's why I do all these um, the books and all that because like when I when I put stuff like this out there, a lot of people come back to me and say that's brilliant. But would you do this and would you do that? And before you know it, I've new ideas then. Yeah. Mm. You know. And and so if you open that dialogue, people will come back and forth w- w- with you. And I think that should be encouraged. Your greatest resource uh, as a coach is other coaches. And most coaches, uh, we, I, I don't like using the, the, the term like um, the circuit, right? But most coaches that are on the circuit all are friends and we'll all share ideas like I touch base with an awful lot of lads and they touch base with me and I, if there's a problem or I have a problem I have one or two fellas I could ring and say come here have you any ideas for this that or the other and so we have that out there and I'd love to see that more freely available to everybody yeah as a goalkeeper at 32 with, with Bob Reagan and then even going into Newtown Blues could you have foreseen the dawn of goalkeeping as it is today with the likes of Rafferty and Began and Morgan and well, even how that's developed in, in a coaching sense well my year right, um, John O'Leary and Mickey McQuillan were the two uh, goalkeepers in my era er, er, they were a couple of years older than me and played with Dublin in the media time and they both lived in Balbriggan so there used to be great um, banter when the Lancer finals would be on they'd go in and get their hair cut in the same barber and there'd be great um, banter between the two of them but John O'Leary used to kick the ball and, and he used to purposely slice the ball 
um, to the right and um, that was his go-to kick out and I used to speak to him about that and he was saying yeah like that's I say like with the slice and he said yeah it's a tactic where he's just trying to disguise it and slice it off to the right so John was kind of probably one of the early components of, of, of the kick out but to me Right, after playing the goals, I'd love to ask people when they talk about um, changing the kickouts, p- putting everybody outside to 45. Do you know how hard it is mm. for the likes of Sean Patton and Rory Began and Niall Morgan to be so accurate for such distances? That is a fan- fantastic scale and it should be lauded rather than um, knocked in the head. Mm. So I-, I think that's brilliant. I will say this about the goalkeepers I, I think they're getting away with murder now because they all want to play outfield. So I think the square ball mo- m- rule should be removed and you should be allowed to tackle them now. If they're going to play as outfield players, treat them as outfield players. I f- a funny feeling that the rule makers are coming after them and that you might find that they'll be bringing in a rule like in soccer a few years ago where you can't take any back passes do you know but the, the thing about this the theory about that is 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 you've got to physically win the space and that allows you to play with skill so what I mean by that is the goalkeepers are joining attacks now so they're creating overloads in certain areas and, and that's allowing you to play the ball and, and that's what they're thinking behind a whole lot of this and if you have a goalkeeper who can contribute that it's a brilliant tactic and I, I, I for one I enjoy it and I think it's do you know what I enjoy I enjoy when they make a mistake yeah. uh, and you see them scrambling mm-hmm. and stuff like yeah. that yeah it's great but, but uh, like is that not is that not exactly how this should work the rules largely say the rules and good quality coaching takes a little bit of time analyzes what's going on practices on the training pitch applies it in low stakes games and then brings it to the high stakes games and that's what that's how things evolve yeah. as opposed to oh I don't like what you're doing so we're going to change the rules because you kept the ball for five minutes and then you scored and you can't be doing that lads it looks a bit too much like soccer it feels to me like but, we're always reactionary changing oh, from the basis without of, doubt and the game's always evolving right and and I would, I would I, like you're always going to have defensive phases right but I'd hazard a guess that the scoring rates are similar to last year's. All right. I wouldn't say that they've dropped them dramatically. Like there's a lot of people crying out and saying it's gone too defensive, but I'd say the scoring rates are are, are, are quite happy. Um, what is happening is you've got um, all out attack phases and all out defence phases. So what's happening? What numbers and labels such as full backs and cornerbacks are becoming redundant now. So there'll be no positions, but. That's brilliant, right? Because now you're coaching a player all the skills, right? Rather than having backs and forwards, you're, you're kind of saying yeah. you, you need to play everywhere. And, and footballers want that. Now, the one thing I will say that I feel is that the individual um, creativeness has been coached out of players. Somebody with the magic dust in the boot who's willing to take a chance, who's willing to do something, that's becoming less and less. And that is a problem. You Everyone, the attacking, are you talking about the attacking mark there? or are you? I'm, I'm talking about in general. Like, I mean, I'd be messing around with some of my kids and, that, and I put some videos up on um, uh, um, the, you know, the very social channels but we were messing around on, on the weekend and one of the kids was doing what we call a scorpion tick, kick where he's solo right and he put the ball around his back and flick it over now he knows if he does that in a match right he's going to be taken off or probably but that that's brilliant to encourage someone to think differently and to be creative so I think we're, we're um, knocking that on the head I think anybody that has a bit more creative mm. anybody that tries something different like a flick of a ball or you know you, something like that or picking a roll and all that they're, 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 they're high risk yeah. moves they're yeah. being coached out well the Dubs fans still give out about Connolly taking the shot from the side line it's like well, you, you won like six in a row here lads shut up but they're still giving out about <laughs> yeah, it like, oh yeah. Connolly taking on the chance like, well, that, it would, yeah. it's anyway. in his locker and you know, exactly. you know so you know it's not in everyone's locker what the problem I find here sometimes is when fellas that can't do that try to do that well <laughs> that's yeah. what happens <laughs> but, um, so on balance what do you think of the state of the game at the moment yeah I, I really think right the fitness levels the tactical now is, there is, 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 is top class the effort these lads are putting in but what I feel right is that you could make a few little tweaks there's too many games far too many games okay I think the the, um, the All Ireland qualifiers are, 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 and the groups, like I know what they're trying to do is trying to avoid dead roar games, but um, it's too much. There has to be something more at stake. Like our championship has been founded on um, the one chance to knock off the mm. big teams and stuff like that, and that's that's gone more and more or less. I'd like to see the balance where the games mean something. Like you go back to the Dublin and Roscommon match, right? I would feel that if if there was something at stake at that, there's no way Dublin would have let them hold that ball for four or five minutes, <laughs> right? So I, I think that's where I do think that's just that. So I think we have. Haven't had the, we haven't got to the end of the season yeah, yet yeah. where from the preliminary quarterfinals it is going to be that yeah, and yeah. we're actually going to have four preliminary quarterfinals four quarterfinals two semis in the final and most of those games should be good they will be good and that yeah. I think at the end of this we're going to be able to go oh, there, there's like a double digit number of good games which yeah. is like 10 more than we normally had yeah, when it possibly, was like yeah, two yeah. semis in the final and even then but, but I'd like to get to them earlier 
Do you know, I, I think I think I'd like to get to them earlier. I'd like to see like, like it's a long season. I think that to train and to play in ratio is far too much. Like I mean, like the, the most senior teams now, county teams will be training three or four nights a week, and they mm. could have boxed off twelve training sessions for one match. Jeez. It's far too much, really. So again, we, we're playing too many games, and then they're going to be expected. To, like if, if they've had a good championship, you'll get them back to the clubs, uh, and they'll be in a good mindset. If they've had a poor enough championship, they're mentally done. They need a break. So um, the clubs are hounding at them. Like it's very difficult for the players at the moment. You know, so it's trying to get that balance right I feel yeah Andy McIntyre was talking about the player uh, the club versus county issue and it, it's the same in Antrim there's definitely progressive counties who've managed to work this out where we're going to expect you to play a certain number of games this year X number are going to be for the county and if you don't mm-hmm. use them up you get them extra for the club but if you do use them up then yeah. the club have a certain amount and, and obviously everybody needs to buy into that uh, and lobby for their own thing but come to an agreement at the end and mm-hmm. go we're going to try this for a period of time um, and it feels like we're getting there in some places and we're miles away from it in others um, I, like I, the obvious answer here is to scrap the league and now the league is the championship and at the end of the championship the best teams play off right yeah. like we were pretty close to getting there and that, I hope that's the direction we're travelling because like the the second tier counties are actually really benefiting from having their playing squads together for the same amount mm-hmm. of time as the elite counties yeah. so that next year they start off the same basis and, and, and another point on that right which, which is probably a little bit left field but you're playing football now when you should be playing football in this type of mm. this type of weather right exactly. and, and that's when everybody wants to play and an awful lot of times um, the, the, the second tier teams have been knocked out of the championship by now and, and they don't get to play and, and really express themselves in the good weather when the ground's hard when you want to be playing football like it's a different game of football yeah. playing in um, November, December than um, June and July like it's, it's a different game and it suits different teams so I think everybody I think that's a good plus I feel too that like I mean I think I think a lot of counties should share information like on how to do this like when I coached a few teams um, in Dublin and um, there was times on a, on a Saturday night I'd get a text and be signed from the Dublin senior manager at the time saying such and such only played 15 minutes for Dublin today they can play with you tomorrow right. and that's brilliant Like yeah. that's because you know where you stand so you kind of you'd be watching matching and be saying don't put them on don't put them on right, or take them off and stuff like that and then you have them tomorrow but everyone knows where, 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 mm. where they stood and then you need buy in from the clubs you can't have clubs complaining that he's allowed to play for the club tomorrow my player isn't you know so you need buy on because like that, that's a really good um, way and I believe Down have, have released some players this weekend right. last weekend to play um, in Armagh I know they have an extended training panel but um, the extended training panel plays league matches for their club right. they train with the county and stuff like that is fair yeah. and that's meeting people halfway people are more than um, willing to do that um, one last thing the Davy Byrne uh, Davy Burke sorry is is um, out in the paper today talking about the attacking mark oh, I don't I don't never really thought the attacking mark made any sense what, what, as a coach obviously you've got to use it because it's part of the repertoire of the, the game I, 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 I hate it I think that I love the kick out mark the kick out mark is fantastic mm. um, this defensive mark and attacking mark has, adds nothing to it it's, it's brought in as a kind of um, a stop mechanism like there's, there's people really exploiting the 20 metre rule little pop pass it's not even a high catch if it was a high catch where you're soaring up in the air and coming down with the ball that's a spectacle <laughs> I, I get that but it's not a spectacle at the minute it's been used for, for something completely different so yeah I would agree entirely with that it's difficult to, um, to coach and it's quick thinking um, and it, sometimes it just kills the whole momentum you know you, you want to see a forward get a ball turn take his man on you know and, and shoot on the move stuff like that you don't see that now like we did talk about this when it was coming in that there was a potential for it to be used this way this isn't after timing mm. like I think everybody realised that this is I, 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 your your sense of our ability to respond to this and change like so I do want some rule changes but I just don't want others well as I mentioned there earlier on about um, informing the policy like like surely like the rule makers should be taking on board the feedback mm. from that the uh, track tackle mark doesn't work and number two everybody's against it so they have to take on that feedback and hopefully that that's a rule change I'd like to see yeah Colin we're, we're almost completely out of time if anybody wants to get their hands on the book what's the best place to get it um, just contact me through the um, social media I'm on social media and Twitter, Instagram and, and stuff like that and yeah we'll, we'll, we'll look after them from there we wish you the very best of luck with it who's going to win the All-Ireland nice handy one to wrap with mm-hmm. um, I, I think Dublin will right mm. yeah. just because they've got the, the I, I, I think I think once they get the level of consistency they're up and down at the moment but when they're good they're very very good and when they're not so good they're still better than a lot of teams alright Colin good stuff congratulations on the book again yeah, thanks very much now OTB AM live with Gillette Labs get the ultimate shaver your money back Neon Night Edition is available now on tomorrow's show Tommy Rooney's 11th edition of the Power Rankings Finney Perth talking about Ireland Greece and plenty more besides right now John Bruin talking about the Champions League final with Joe last night uh, have a great day now you're very welcome back so with further thoughts on Manchester City's Champions League win very happy to say John Bruin is with us good evening 
Good evening, Joe. How are you? Very well. So, Manchester City's treble winning season. The obvious mm. point of comparison is Manchester United in 99. That's been very much the uh, thread of conversation over the last couple of weeks. Um, very, very different in so many ways. If Manchester United was last-ditch heroics, Man City has been um, uh, keeping everybody firmly at arm's length, demonstration of sophistication and brilliance and probably hasn't quite captured the imagination. Did it uh, move you, John? Did it grab you? How did you feel on Saturday as you watch an English club do something which is remarkable? I mean, it's a remarkable achievement and for most of us, it just it didn't seem to have the magic in the air that it really should have had I would share that sentiment yeah the, the, the magic wasn't quite there now um, why would that be those are the big questions I, I, okay let's start with the fact that City are so so dominant and, and it has been okay let's not set aside Arsenal's efforts uh, in the Premier League but they had an excellent season um, the cup final in all honesty you know City held Manchester United at arm's length but you know go back to the 99 treble you could say that Manchester United did the same to Newcastle back then so that's you know the league but this but the final itself um yeah, a fairly cold spectacle. Um, I thought I thought Inter played very well, uh, but you know they did everything right <laughs> and and almost got into how to stop City. It's just that they forgot how to not concede a goal and they forgot how to score. And you know that was very glib, but it, it, they were sort of close. It wasn't as easy for City as we'd expected, um, and. I, I, from watching the game and talking to a few people that were there it did feel as if the emotion particularly among the city staff rather than the fans was that of relief that this treble there was a certain point maybe March, April when you suddenly thought hang on City could do the treble here because back in February it was Manchester City in a title race and we, we hadn't considered the FA Cup and Champions League it almost felt like it's a relief it's done now City have conquered the Champions League they have no more worlds to conquer um, and Guardiola his whole yeah, it's, of course uh, it has that manic demeanour but um, he seemed relieved as well and uh, this morning um, working this morning you get this report out of City that he will see out two more years of his contracts um, which you begin to think well is it, so what's the plan then is it is to create the dynasty of winning two more Champions League what follows next mm. um, and, and the thing is um, you know as Roy Keane the, you know, the, the, the leader of that treble team uh, it, always said was that the thing is once you win things it's always on to the next thing and um, as happy as the City fans are and you know they're currently filling the Dean's Gate in waiting for, for those um the, the, the open top bus um, it doesn't stop there the work doesn't stop there um, and does a treble in 2023 mean as much as in 1999 I'm not sure it does but then again I'm not a Manchester City fan so let's put it that way yeah but I do think that it, the Manchester United treble uh, felt like more of an event yeah. to the neutrals than this city treble does for various reasons the money spent and not least um, you know under the uh, cloud of the 115 charges looms large and City mm. already had to pay a fine to UEFA lest we forget the ease with which they breezed through the knockout stages you know they stick seven past Leipzig they destroy Bayern Munich that 3-0 was not even a reflection of just how good they were they destroy Real Madrid 4-0 and they don't play very well against Inter but they get the job done and you sort of felt like they always would uh, it's, it's not like there aren't great pockets of emotion or likability here I mean Jack Grealish's interview where he's too emotional really to be coherent is just charming as every Jack Grealish interview yeah, is yeah. And, he's, and he's incredibly likeable um, but I, I like the defining difference I think is Ferguson football bloody hell this sense of wonder like in 99 the line would have been said by everybody we will never see this again this was a miracle this was a miracle yeah. 
And now I think, gun to your head, will City do the treble again next year or not? I'd probably it's say. It's entirely possible, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, a decent chance on all fronts, i got to say. Yeah, yeah. And, and actually, I think you drive a very good point, which is um, set aside the Premier League, set aside the FA Cup. I think the Champions League has been a very disappointing competition this season. Yeah. Now, again, let's not, you know, let's not, yeah, that's not City's fault, but I think European um, clubs are flagging. Uh, there was this point where it was pretty much Real Madrid up against the English clubs, as it's been for the last few years they pushed on in years and now we we have Manchester City who dominate England who should be dominating England then they should be dominating Europe that's a, it's a natural run of things um, and yeah and, and the thing is I, I think you make a good point about the drama of the event now of course today uh, I was writing a piece about um, Silvio Berlusconi of course now um, the football man despite everything else and uh, you know bunga bunga all that stuff uh, he was a football man and consider the drama and the majesty uh, certainly for people of my age of, of that Milan club back in 88 89 90 94 and then into the 2000 you know of like a mega club of like you know Milan dripped glamour didn't they mm. uh, and they had these world stars um, and um, you know they, maybe Berlusconi invented this idea of the super club and you know obviously Pep Guardiola himself has taken a lot of the stylings from that pressing game that that, that Sarchi brought to, to football and yet Manchester City are a, a, an amalgam of all those things with with money spent beyond even Silvio Berlusconi's um, dreams and it arrives and yeah there is this rather cold feeling and you look to the you know to the to, to the rostrum when the uh, well, in, in, in this, the box where you've got Gianni Infantino, you've got Seferin, you've got, and you've got the head of a government that own of a country that own this club, mm. and that is a very different thing. Now, of course, Silvio Berlusconi was a, a prime minister of a country while he owned Milan, so this has been done before, but it feels rather different because the the, the the influence of geopolitics and the way that the game has changed and the way that the game has become this very big tool uh, and. Let's say I think that someone was saying the other day. I think it's very true. You know, um, Abu Dhabi. It's about soft power. But when a club like Newcastle is bought by Saudi Arabia, well, then you've got hard power because you know Saudi Arabia are a, are a big power. And this is the way that it's shifting. And when journalists like you know our friend Miguel Delaney kick against that, they're criticised, and you have you know they haven't been hassled by Manchester City fans for not believing in their dream and it feels to me that City if you're a City fan fine go and enjoy yourself but you can't let other people not have doubts about that mm. and not have the questions that they raise against that now Manchester United back in 99 well you know uh, they're owned by uh, a PLC um, the money originally came from uh, you know Martin Edwards uh, if you're from sort of my part of the world the Edwards family were known as the butchers that provided you know dodgy school dinners for you <laughs> it, you know this is how it was back back then um football clubs have been owned by people of dodgy reputations through history yeah including Silvio Berlusconi this felt different uh and the, but it's almost like the surgical fashion with which Guardiola did this all credit to him he's absolutely mastered football but yeah coldness coldness is what was shared and I think like I do, I, you obviously won't have watched the footage over uh, or maybe not the footage over here on, on BT you know outgoing broadcasters and it was like a celebration of something that I'm not sure the audience was celebrating with them no I, I do want to talk to you about BT um, I've never felt so out of kilter watching anything in my life actually yeah yeah was, yeah uh, seen. and by the way when you talk about that surgical um, precision because it would be obviously completely wrong of us and neither of us are saying that Manchester United were a universally popular entity in 99 absolutely they not were, you we're know, loads beyond all yes. loads yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and much, much, much more than Manchester City yeah. well, in a way that's the point that there was a vibrancy yeah. there that compelled a reaction either way and so there were England fans who did stand up and, and, and chant at matches stand up if you hate United and lots of people stood up but at least there was like a, a reaction either way on the surgical precision point amazing stats on 
City's treble versus United's treble. So goals scored, not too far off actually. And to be fair, like that United team would be remembered as a free scoring attacking team. So uh, City won 4 9, United won 2 8. Goals conceded City a meagre 33 to United 60. And then I suppose the defining one, the win percentage across the season City 73%, United 58%. So, you what know, draws, just, as I recall. That, yeah. that, that lack that of last effort. minute draws. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So it just all felt very different. On the BT Sport um, point, so uh, a fair proportion of people over here would get BT Sport if they're um, yeah. if they're paying out for it. Uh, they, they've had about a decade now, um, and they're obviously rebranding as TNT Sport. And Jay Comfrey, their lead presenter, is um, departing the scene to uh, he's stepping back, was how he put it, to concentrate mm. on other projects. So I have to say, I don't think, and it's just based on social media and maybe anecdotal conversations, and, and, and Saturday night was a particular encapsulation. I think it's probably the most maligned football coverage I can think of. Yeah, 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 I, 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 th- I think so. And I, I often think, I mean, listen, um, uh, you know, I used to work for ESPN uh, and uh, for whom BT inherited quite a lot of coverage. And I know that it's difficult to do this stuff, right? Yeah. You work in TV yourself, Joe, you know this. Um, but I do think that there has there's been some, some real missteps I think uh, I, 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 there was an issue earlier this season um, I think actually the Milan semi-final where the pundits clearly did not know much about Milan what they knew about Milan was like you know Kaká used to play for them and Shevchenko it was of that level they've had to rethink it they've had people like Jamie Horncastle I know you know an expert you know he's a total world expert on Italian football that works but it's the cheerleading factor. Now, it's always been one of those things that's amused me. Now, back in the ITV days, you'd have things like Clive Tildesley commentating on a Wednesday night match at Old Trafford, and he'd say, you know, good news reaches us from Stamford Bridge. And I'd think, well, he's probably going to say Chelsea has scored. Well, most Manchester United fans, their, their, their version of good news would be Chelsea conceding a goal to Fiorentina over they were playing. There is this cheerleading thing, this idea that we all want English teams to do well in Europe I don't think it exists not not in, in, in any amongst English fans that I know or those that are particularly um, passionate fans um, and yeah th- this uh, there were some real missteps in it and you know you, it's difficult it's hard to criticise individuals because you understand that you know production can go wrong and it's a, it's all of a piece but you had this uh, this thing with uh, Julian Lescott Julian Lescott yeah, a Manchester City player, one of the players that I think played in their first breakthrough. So they won a title with him in defence and they won the FA Cup with him. They were talking to Julian Escott, you know, what, how are your nerves now, Julian? Now, Julian Escott is from Wolverhampton, was a Villa fan, played more games for Wolves and Everton than he did for City. Now, obviously, he made his fortune, his fame and fortune with City, but City did sell him at a certain point. And he has to sort of act as this super fan. It was a really. It, it, it misfired as as a as an idea, but he, it's, um, it's, and then, he embraced the role. Yeah. I mean, you know, yeah. you, oh, well, pretty, sure. pretty nervous, pretty nervous, and then I, even at the end he takes time out to you know praise the people behind the scenes and makes a real point of praising the owner who you yeah. know is attending his second ever Manchester City yeah. game <laughs> yeah. and it, again it just feels like these are odd choices to be making I, I it's all look it's it's a criticism generally of, 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 of pundits across the board like it's not like Neville and, and Carragher are hiding their allegiances and, and no, I guess no, there's no. an honesty about that but I, I don't when, when there is such controversy about the club to be praising the owner as if it's Jack Walker in tears you know we did it boys yeah. That that's a more complicated decision to make and it, it's a decision you need to actually think about yeah yeah I mean listen we've had this before I mean you know we had uh, when Leicester won the league you know suddenly the king of Thailand is wheeled out and uh, you know suddenly it was all brave and it, that is a slightly questionable thing because we don't know what, what that might may represent but I think in Abu Dhabi we do and I think BT made a few mistakes because okay he, and I know you, you, you're an aficionado of Jack Grealish but he also had the Kyle Walker thing Kyle Walker came out and gave a very honest interview about how he's from a very poor part of Sheffield uh, you know how his, his mother didn't have uh, a quid to buy him a, a nice lolly and all that 
and it, this was almost brushed aside by but DJ come free Ray Ferdinand what's the first drink you're going to go out there and get come on now you've got a story to tell here you've got a human side because the thing that Manchester City require is a human side yeah. to sell to people to, to make people think okay there's more to it you know you've got Phil Foden a, a, a City fan as a, as a boy you've got you know every one of those players I mean you know Gundogan in Turkey or you know a lot of stories to tell and Gundogan ended up Des Kelly ended up asking for an autograph from him yeah I mean Des Kelly is a you know I know Des Kelly is a nice guy but Des Kelly was a you know pretty high ranking journalist and I couldn't believe what I was seeing yeah you know like it it is hard to know what they're trying to do. I mean, they're they're certainly appealing to Man City fans, and they're they're yeah. You know that 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 seems to be the um, the editorial. But is that line. not a reaction? Is that not a reaction to some of the? Uh, I would imagine uh, that uh, Manchester City fans have kicked back, yeah, and they've had that criticism, and that's their reaction to it. I think that's a big I, part. I, of I think it. that's true. I think the modern era television companies are hyper aware of what's been said on social media and so a loud Man City contingent contingent will I think register but like it's it's a, like the decade I think has been maligned in general Saturday was a particular example because you, you kind of feel as a as a viewer I, I, I'm kind of trusting this entity to employ certain journalistic standards and so to cover Man City and, and to not address in a very meaningful way this massive cloud this massive mm. cloud unprecedented cloud hanging over their spending in their season to not even address that is just wrong like it, it, there's no argument for that and maybe they feel oh they'll, they'll spoil the mood or spoil the party but you, you're not just there to have a party like you're there to have interesting discussion and, and, and to explain to a viewer who might not be reading you know the granular details on, on that 115 uh, chart situation uh, against them to, to explain that to them in, in some shape or form but the thing like you know at full time Darren Fletcher says something along the lines of I don't know the verbatim quote but it's along the lines of you know the greatest kind of story in club football has its ending yeah. Yeah, but that was like someone pulling up, pulling up a handbrake on the coverage I mean it's a lot of things it's not the greatest story in club football or certainly no. or certainly if it is then Darren is not referring to the chapters 2008 to 2022 this is like it, it's played as like Swindon Town here have come from League One to become champions of Europe and then you know I, I, I don't know what they expected from Mario Balotelli but like yeah. I, quite, I quite enjoyed him I, 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 I enjoyed his glibness and, and the idea of just like why did you ask me yeah but you, like, it, it, so you enjoyed rubber necking on an absolute car crash but I mean like, <laughs> but, but, but even that suggests okay he played for Inter played for City that's what I mean even that suggests they, they have no intention of having a serious conversation about no. how we are to feel about this Man City team this project I don't know it, 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 I, I think they're almost actually if I was to boil it down to a sentence they're giving the intelligence of the vast majority of viewers no credit and they're Absolutely. appeasing I, a loud mob who were like you know like you'd almost have to come out wearing Man City jerseys and, and jump up and down for them to be happy so like who cares about them well, well, the, th the thing is Joe of course like to, to have a BT uh, uh, subscription is a considerable uh, investment financially yeah. so you're presumably going to have a considerable interest in football that's it and I do I do agree you've got to treat the audience with a bit more respect than that and um, you know even blessed Richard Keyes uh, I'm told ran through uh, you know a, a significant portion of what the charges mean and what it could mean and, and the, the cloud hanging over Manchester John sorry I, I get, like so Richard Keyes you know <laughs> many many failings there's a journalistic instinct there it's a journalist Yes. And 100% on the biggest night of the season with this massive cloud, if we're not addressing this, if we're not talking about this, we're just not doing our job. Like, what is the point of being here otherwise? And I, look, after the West Ham game, the party, absolutely. Should yeah. you bring it up uh, just after Jack Grealish has come over in tears? And, and, and is that the moment to bring it up? Probably not. Like, I, I, you got to be fair and understand there is a tone to set, but to just like whitewash the thing. I think I think another another criticism I would make is um, now we go back a year to Paris when you know something really nasty nearly happened. Yeah, it didn't. It was nasty enough. Um, BC 
acted as if nothing was happening there. And there was a point where, I mean, I know Jer was there for you, and you know, obviously I have colleagues that were at the game and friends that were there as City fans. And there's a mounting problem of people having to go to this stadium. I was there in 2005, and I was looking at it and thinking, they haven't improved it since 2005. Mm. They haven't improved the logistics. And BT, again, oh, the City fans are a bit late. Why are they late? You know, uh, what, and um, oh, the city the city bus is a bit late. Why is it late? Mm. Ask the question. Tell the tell the story of what is going on. And of course, again, I suppose if you're a host broadcaster, you've got a contract with the UEFA. You don't like to criticise the people that provide you with the the deal. We have to. It does. Uh, it does, know, that's it big, does yeah, it does strike because again. It's, the criticism they get is probably like OTT like everything in football it's just toxic you know any absolutely a, any kind of interaction I have with football at Twitter it's really grim um, so it's, it's, yeah. it's horrific and I suspect somehow they've lost their confidence and they're trying to be as inoffensive to as many people mm. as possible yeah yeah and the thing is yeah, we say this and it relaunches in you know, yeah. a couple of months we will see uh, that um actually from talking to people involved there it's all very opaque they've shut down the office uh, which used to be at the the old um, Olympic Park that, uh, where you would have uh, I know you worked over here for the yeah. uh, Olympics that's gone they're back over to West London where most TV production is done and no one knows anything it's as much as it is from, from speaking to colleagues um, whether it's going to be uh, you know dumbed down cheapened or whether they're going to have where the presenters are going to be it did look to me as though Rio Ferdinand fancies being a presenter rather than a pundit uh, in some of his interactions on there that's just a, a hunch that I've got yeah. But well, was, but the um, but it is uh, yeah. We just don't know what to expect from them. This this new company and th- there is a long way back from what we saw that night because it was a it was a disaster really for them. Yeah. And yeah, as a sign off, ouch. Mm. Yeah. Uh, we are pretty much. It's hey, listen. It's lucky we're so great, right? So well, yeah. I mean, listen. I'm conscious I mean, of that. I, 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 Joe, I've written some absolute rubbish in my time, and I've spoken some absolute rubbish to you over the years. You know, this is this is how it's done, and you know, and nobody's perfect, of course. But there was a rather ill-starred thing and uh, considering what had happened the previous year and considering um, what it meant and considering the issues that were there they took their eye off the ball it's a shame and I'm, f- I'm sure there's a few wounds being lit there and you know uh, let's see what goes on next time with Manchester City in next year's Champions League final because I think they'll be there don't you? Yeah I would guess so to be honest John Brune always a pleasure thanks Mel. Cheers, Joe. OTB AM with Gillette Labs. Get the ultimate shave or your money back. Neon Night Edition available now. This.